uh, Bergner's Cars, uh, as well as uh, Hallie Siegel. Uh, on behalf of everyone at the Institute, I would like to thank you for joining us here in Toronto, whether virtually or physically in person. Uh, and we're really looking forward to an exciting three days of uh, presentations, uh, some, some interactions which have been sorely missed, and some uh, great discussions. Back to Steve. Yep. So um, uh, we have a really wonderful set of sponsors here as well. So both online and in person. Um, so uh, everyone who is uh, in attendance, please uh, seek, seek them out. Um, so particularly, we want to thank Oxbotica, uh, Gaddick, NRC, and Aplanix, who are all our gold level sponsors. And we'll all take the opportunity to talk to you uh, directly uh, during the conference. So we'll start each day with a talk from one of our sponsors. And similarly, on Wednesday, just before the awards banquet, we'll have uh, the fourth talk. Um, we also have uh, Huawei, uh, Hexagon, and Autonomous Stuff, uh, the Vector Inst Institute, uh, CompuSalt, and even um, Ingenuity Labs from Queen's University, which is a sort of sister robotics institute uh, building uh, out of Queen's. Um, so some really uh, exciting partners here. Um, so especially to the students that are in attendance, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to our various partners and, uh, and talk them up and, and find some great job opportunities. I know most of them are hiring extensively and trying to grow their operations. And Ryan's given me a big thumbs up. Um, so, you know, Oxbotica is clearly on that list as well. Okay, so just popping back over to me just for a moment. Um, I just wanted to say a few brief words today, excuse my voice, on logistics. So we're, uh, we're not all able to be uh, together in person this year. We knew that going in in advance, we decided that AI CRV had to be an online first hybrid model event uh, to give a consistent experience to everyone. So the way this will work is that all presenters will present by Zoom, in case you're wondering. Um, that'll be separate from the in-person event. So presenters who are actually physically at the RI uh, on the UFT campus, will have access to quiet presentation rooms uh, that are available to them. Um, so the audience won't be able to tell the difference whether you're uh, virtual, uh, remote somewhere, or actually on the UFT campus. Um, for in-person attendees, if you're looking to view the event, there are two in-person viewing rooms, uh, one for each primary track of the conference. Uh, and so people in these rooms will need to move to the front of the room to ask questions, and that's important. So uh, we will have a moderator on hand to make sure the uh, questions make it to the online speakers. Uh, we've intentionally kept the coffee break short and have a one hour lunch, uh, locations which are nearby and will be listed on the monitors. And uh, there is, uh, for those of you who are local, an in-person dinner tonight, uh, about 70 folks have registered for that. Um, you should all have the links for the two breakout rooms, one for each track. And uh, again, presenters who are in person do have those quiet rooms for their presentations. Back to Steve. Perfect. Um, so a few uh, events throughout the conference I just want to bring your attention to. Um, so we have uh, today at lunch, the annual uh, general meeting for Kippers, which is the society that runs the uh, conference on robot and vision. So half of this conference. Um, so that's starting at 1.45. There'll be a 15 minute break uh, to, for in person people to get their lunch. Um, we have this in-person dinner tonight, as mentioned, it's going to be at the faculty club, which is just a short walk up the street, so everyone in Toronto, uh, please join us there. Um, Wednesday night will be awards, that'll be purely virtual and online, um, and so uh, please, you know, stay tuned for that one, uh, it'll follow directly on the sponsor talk on Wednesday, and the annual general meeting for the AI conference for Kayak is on the Thursday afternoon, and so that's in the AI schedule, you can see that there. Um, okay, and then the last thing I want to mention before we get rolling um, is that we have two great keynotes today, one for the AI conference and one for CRV. Um, and so for CRV uh, at 11.10, we have Lourdes Agapito. Um, so she's from University College London, and she'll be talking about uh, learning to reconstruct the 3D world from images and video. And then the keynote for the AI conference is at 12.30, and we have our own Nicholas Pepperneau. Um, and he's going to talk to us about uh, is differential privacy a silver bullet for machine learning. Uh, all right, so that's it for us. Um, and now I'll pass it over to John to introduce our first uh, sponsored speaker, uh, Ryan Smith. Great, wonderful. Thanks to you. So I'll just say one, uh, one last thing. Thanks also to all of the volunteers that are working today to help us on site and also who have helped us uh, throughout preparing and also big thanks to Steve um, he's being too modest. He's the real general chair. I just get to tag along for the, for the ride. Um, I am delighted today to uh, introduce our first sponsored speaker, Ryan Smith, Dr. Ryan Smith from Oxbotica, 
whom I happen to know from a few years ago. <laughs> uh, so Ryan received his PhD in 2008 from the University of Hawaii at uh, Manoa in geometric control theory and uh, its applications to underwater vehicles under uh, Professor uh, Chiba in the Department of Mathematics. Uh, then he was a lecturer at uh, the Queensland University of Technology from 2011 to 2013, an assistant and an associate professor at Fort, Fort Lewis College, pardon me, in Durango, Colorado from 13 to 19. And now, I'm, well, recently in 2019, he joined Oxbotica. I think he's having a lot of fun where he is now VP of Technical Solutions. And I believe he's going to tell us all about that. So without further ado, Dr. Smith, whenever you're ready, take it away. We're excited to hear this. Thanks so much, Jonathan. I really appreciate that. It's, uh, it's been quite a ride and thanks so much for having me today. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna pull my talk up here and see. Can everybody see that now? Let's move that, hit the play button. Are we good now? Everybody see that? So Looks great. we had an introduction uh, yesterday on Oxbotica by the VP of technology, Ben Upcroft, uh, my counterpart uh, at the company, the other VP on board. And uh, I'm here to just dive in a little bit deeper um, on the technology that we have and cover one of our components that we're really excited about that's come out in the last uh, few months actually at Oxbotica called MetaDriver. And this is a technology that we're using to do hard miles without hard miles. And we'll get into what that really means uh, in the next couple of slides. So <clears throat> um, this is a really interesting slide. And I don't think any other company in the world can show uh, this slide, not because they don't have a uh, keynote or the actual movies for this, but if you look at this, this is multiple different vehicles, multiple different environments, multiple different hardware sets uh, running across the world, but running the exact same software stack, which is the Xbotica driver stack. And we're really excited about this technology. Um, we base the fundamental tagline for Xbotica is universal autonomy. And we're truly achieving that goal across many different platforms all over the world with many different partners. And as you probably heard from Ben yesterday, um, we're achieving a as we say, a horizontal across verticals as you uh, move through uh, our company and the approach to universal autonomy. So how do we do that? How do we look at this? Um, Oxbotica is fundamentally enabled by three components. Um, Oxbotica driver, which is the on-vehicle software. Uh, Oxbotica cloud, which is our fleet management system, which, which is, uh, exists in the cloud and allows our, us to control our fleets um, and all the operator APIs. And what I'm going to dive into today is MetaDriver, which is um, what we built as a rapid uh, VNV tool to go from development to production really, really fast and enable autonomous technology um, for the future. And all of these three things are tied together with our uh, unique Compose architecture, which allows us um, to bring together multiple different components, multiple different algorithms to suit all the different environments that we, we approach. So how do we build autonomous systems for autonomous vehicles? Um, <clears throat> really what we want to do is we focused on our customer. We want it to be easy to use. So the end user should be able to install the binaries on our vehicle, any vehicle, anywhere with any hardware set, make that quick and easy to install and be up and autonomous in any environment very quickly on the order of 60 to 70 minutes or something like that on a new site. We want to be flexible. We don't want to prescribe the vehicle, the hardware, the compute, uh, whatever that is for any component or any customer that we're working with. We want to be able to put the software on and have it run anywhere. With electric vehicles and decarbonization coming into a lot of different sectors that we see today, um, low energy is gonna be important. Uh, our stack right now runs under 200 watts and we're aiming for less than 100 uh, in the years to come as we develop uh, moving forward. And that's a, a big benchmark for us to be able to be competitive and to be able to be scalable across many different platforms. Safety is architected in from the beginning uh, with what we do at Oxbotica. Um, <clears throat> fundamentally, uh, it's independent of the design path. We have redundancy in both algorithms, in sensors, um, and across the entire stack, and we're fully auditable. And that comes from the vested interest to be safe from the beginning and build everything around the safety case and the safe operation. And what we really want is to be viable for BNB. 
um, that's validation and verification of the stack. We're putting autonomy now into places where they're accepting robots as being part of their environment. And this may include um, places that are kind of dangerous like mine sites or refineries um, where they need to understand that the software that's operating a robot within their environment that is quite dangerous or um, you know, if you hit something can be very disastrous, um, that that software has been validated and verified for that environment with that vehicle in that place uh, so that it can operate safely. And we need it to be tested. And right now, what we're looking at from the automotive industry is testing, validation, verification is go out and run 10 to the nine miles and run them and run them and run them until you see that odd case and can test against that odd niche corner case. So how do we do this so we, we don't wanna wait to see what's odd, okay? We don't wanna go out and drive all of the miles in all of the places. We wanna drive the fewest miles because we're a software company. We're not a car company. We don't drive a lot of miles. We want to test just those cases that are specific to our software and specific to the customer's needs to let them know that it's safe in their place. And when we look at deploying vehicles, we really understand that for the first deployments that we're going to do through this autonomous technology, we're not driving all places all the time. We care about specific places like um, a mine site in Western Canada, a refinery in Germany, um, you know, a, you know, a shuttle that's driving around uh, downtown London in the UK. Um, so it's a specific place with a specific vehicle. Um, not all the places, because that shuttle is not going to drive over in Silicon Valley, United States tomorrow. It's not going to be teleported over there. And when we look at these, we want to run the hard cases through CI every night. We want to test the newest and latest releases that have been against the hardest and most difficult cases all the time. We don't want legacy cases that we've already solved to be tested against because we solve for them and we know them. We want to gather the experience from all of the cases that we've done and develop the software to handle those moving forward. And we want to find the hard cases quickly. Like I say, we don't want to drive all the miles and um, <clears throat> find those one or two odd cases after years and years. Uh, of testing. We want to find those really quickly and we want to be deduped. So we don't want to have 10,000 cases in our CI that are slightly similar, that look like the same flavor. Um, we want the one or two cases that clearly identify that issue and we want to test against those and we want a, uh, <clears throat> a component of cases that complementarily uh, achieves the safety case for that, that area. And these are the attributes that we're driving for. So how do we start? Well, one way to start when you're, look, when you're coming from an autonomy company and a software development company is to build up a simulator. And so we have real life simulators um, that look like actual environments that are run with a physics engine in the background. They run software in the loop. So we have Oxbotica driver running on the vehicles in the simulator, running simulated scenarios all the way through. And so as you can see, we can bring in <clears throat> actors, we can run through realistic, photorealistic environments, we can do scene imports, we can do um, sensor simulation, sensor verification, validation, things like this within the simulator. But that would be the easy thing to do. And that's the normal thing that, a comp that you should do. So how do we leverage this technology as good software engineers and good developers to our advantage? So the first thing you might think about is you're out driving around, you get a lot of data. What if we were to take that data and change it just a little bit? How can we update that data without any human intervention to get more data? And this is what we call data expansion. So the, the first piece of this would be class swapping. So you look at your semantic scene, your semantic classifications, and you just start swapping those around. And so here, what I've got is we're cycling through a bunch of images where we're swapping the class of building or structure to trees or forest. And so you can see the left images are the real images, the right images are the faked or the swapped images where we're just swapping classes across. Now that's, that's one of the first instances there. 
And then what you can do is you can start to add some weather. So on the upper left here, what you see is us driving through uh, a UK road. And then on the bottom there, we've added some rain, some dripping rain on the lenses. And this is not human added, this is all AI generated. On the right hand side, we were driving around at night. We gathered some data at night and we put some rain on top of that. So we can add in some weather. We can do this with snow. We can do this with fog. You can add in pieces there. And then we can change from day to night. So on the left, you see images taken in the daytime. On the right, you'll see images that are uh, fake to be nighttime. Same image, we just change it from day to night. And then we can start to combine a few of these things. And so in our simulator, we can actually have a, a Python backend and we can script up every scenario that you would ever want. But again, that takes a lot of human time. We don't have a lot of human time. We want to do this fast and reliably and automatedly. And so what we can do is we can start with an image in the upper left, bless you. And um, we can have a, an image of a suburban road uh, or country road out in Germany. And we can actually change the road markings uh, in that middle, uh, the upper middle of the uh, image there. And we can add in a new lane. Now that looks a little bit weird, but just, just go with me here. Um, now we can swap the classes and we can put in trees where there used to be buildings. So we can take the buildings out. And then we can add a road user. And that road user, we know exactly where that road user is. So we have ground truth. So we can look at false negative, false positive detections with our sensors in there too. We can add some rain and then we can make it be night. Now tell me, or think about this in your head, how many times would you have to drive on this road with a car, with a human in that car, collecting data to see a three lane road in a countryside in Germany with those trees, with a cyclist raining at night. That would take a lot of time, but we can do that instantaneously with the AI that we generated. And not only that, but we get all six of these instances for this same location. So we can chain all of these things together and we can build up a data expansion um, <clears throat> uh, of, of what we have just from the data that we have in our system. We can also then create new environments. These are all synthetic images of representative mind sites that we've generated from uh, some in images we've collected online uh, and some other things that we've done in quarries and whatnot and allows us to skill up our AI to drive and operate, find free, free space, find driving lanes in areas that we've never been before. And this enabled us to head to customer sites and drive in their customer sites uh, autonomously within a very short amount of time, following all the rules and adhering to everything without having been there before. Now that is basically the sim to real. Now we can also go the other way. So we can go real to sim. And this is really interesting. So what we can do here is with MetaDriver, we can take instances that are flagged by our, our drivers uh, on the roads, whether in open or closed loop autonomy. And you can see this is a man behind uh, bin lorry is the, the name of this video. If you look at it on YouTube or anything, walks out in the middle of the street, kind of walks around, um, we worry about people like this sometimes um, and what their actual intentions might be, but we have to care for them um, as we drive our autonomous vehicles around. And what we've done here is taken this video and saying, this is a really odd thing. Like, interesting, we've caught this. But you might want to say, we, might, we want to look at this and we want to understand um, from this video what we might need to do. So we can form a descriptor from this real image and we can port that into simulation without anybody having to write a single character in code or a single line of code. And you can see this isn't an exact representation pictorially, but it does represent the scene of somebody walking out behind a bin lorry in our simulator with a car coming at you. And we can replay this over and over and try to find the scenarios um, that, may, that we want to replay or generate against our, um, our, our AV. Now, for each scenario, you may want to fuzz that, um, but naive fuzzing is exactly as it says, naive. Uh, we get a discretized situation of um, movements that you might have, and you, you don't really understand what, what you're doing if you only pick the, the nine or 10 different directions that you want to move in. Um, this is Lady Crosses Against Red Light. If you want to look that one up on YouTube too, this is a very famous video. Um, we'll see a little bit more of it later. 
But pulling this one in, how do we know how to fuzz this image? And do we want a human to actually put in the fuzzing parameters to discretize how this person may or may not move? Instead of doing that, what we start with is the seed, um, man walking out behind Bin Lorry, and we use an adversarial uh, reinforcement learning network to actually test against the specific vehicle, the specific location, and the specific version of the software to find the most adversarial scenarios for that release of software in that location with that vehicle um, that would cause the most issues or the, that would cause the highest jerk or um, you know, maybe the, the most harsh braking event that you would see that would be uncomfortable for that scenario. And what we can do then is figure out what those paths might be and then bring those into our development pipeline as field bugs or things to look at that these are the situations that are the edge cases that are the places where our, the, the AV stack may struggle if that were to happen. Okay, so now we're actually testing right on the edge. We're looking at the challenging situations that our, our vehicle is going to experience given uh, the environment that it's in. So the red places is where we might have felt too much of a harsh break or there was a, a potential um, you know, dangerous situation that either the human or the vehicle was put into. And the green are paths that actually worked out to be okay and the vehicle was able to handle those. And we look at these across all not only motions in XY, but also velocity and acceleration of each of the actors within the scene. And we can do this all autonomously. And so then what we can do is we can look at these scenes and you can see, you know, here we've changed man walking out from behind Bin Lorry up in the upper left to man walking out in front of Bin Lorry. Um, and the interesting thing is if you look over on the far right, we worked with some of our customers and uh, driving around a refinery in the upper right there, you'll see that if the man walks out from behind that structure and the car is going at a certain speed limit, which is the speed limit for the refinery, the braking there is a little bit hard. And we actually advised our customer that you may want to change the speed limit around that corner because if a human walked out, regardless if the car is driven by a human or by an AV, that that's a dangerous corner. And they actually took that advice and changed that. Similarly, down in the lower right, if a human walked out from behind the rear axle of a large truck, that may cause a problem at that corner in that mine with those vehicles driving. And so you can see how we can actually look at um, addressing a lot of the scenarios for V and V and look at specific edge cases and generate edge cases that may be a problem very quickly, um, very robustly. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> Now you say, well, how do you get all these? Well, it's really expensive again for um, the seeding of these scenarios to be based upon the operator, tagging them and saying, oh, this is interesting. Oh, that is interesting. And what we might wanna do is kind of automate that a little bit or try to seed it in some other way. And so what we've done is through our log files, we basically developed a natural language search and so all of the data that's collected by all of our vehicles and even more, we can put in whatever we want into here. We, uh, and this is not human labeled data. This is a total, this is a database of all the data we have. Uh, human natural language search, type in whatever we wanna type in and bring up scenarios across all of the data we've collected and then bring in our seeds into our meta driver scenario to try to find the edge cases against those. And what you can see here, we're typing in pedestrian crossings. Now here's gonna be one, people on pedestrian crossings. We can pick up these. And I'll display a little bit more here. And you can see kind of the power of that search that we're running through people on the street. And now what this does is if you look at this, um, what's, the, what, what's the end goal? Where are we headed here? The, the total end message is we're not driving anywhere all the time. And so we can eliminate that drive anywhere infinite scenarios. We're gonna drive somewhere and we can really restrict that down to some finite scenarios. Look at what the customer is defining as their route. And if we flip this on our head and we can actually empower the vehicle to operate safely by it taking an exam of the areas that we know that we can show that it's safe. And then we can give it the descriptors in reverse and from the real to sim, we can actually go back from sim to real and say, where do you know that you're safe? And the other one is, where do you 
are unknown, unsafe. And those are the problem areas. So when you have an AV driving around that looks at its exam and says, at, at, at its environment and says, have I been tested against this in an exam scenario? And if it says no, if the descriptors don't line up to some scenario that's been seen and tested against through our meta driver software, it can say, hey, I'm gonna stop, do a minimal risk maneuver and say, I'm unknown, unsafe right now. And then it can ask for help from an external remote person and say, maybe they say proceed or maybe they say stay there or something like that. And then we can add that to the lexicon of the vehicle so that then we can actually grab all of the experience from all of the vehicles driving around and empower more AVs to be more smart on the, on the roads around the world. Thank you for your time uh, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. That was excellent. Thank you, uh, Dr. Smith, fantastic talk. And um, I think as Ryan mentioned, Oxbotica is continuing to look for great folks. So if you are interested, don't hesitate to, to reach out. All right. So with that, we'll thank, uh, we'll thank Ryan uh, one more time for his wonderful talk. And uh, now we're going to split into um, the, uh, the breakout rooms for AI and for CRV separately. And uh, we'll, we'll see you in each of those uh, for your uh, respective keynote talks coming up. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. And just a little guidance on the breakout rooms. So you have to go down to the button at the bottom that says breakout room. It'll pop up a little window. And then you look into the two breakout rooms, either the AI or the CRV conference, and there'll be a small blue join button hiding there along the banner for that room. Um, so look for that join button and that should get you into the correct breakout room. And then don't hesitate to message us if you're having trouble finding it or anything like that. Uh, all right, we'll see you in person in the, uh, or in, the, uh, in the various rooms. Enjoy the conference. That's perfect. And we have the recording. So yeah, let me share my screen and give a few more details until we wait for everyone to be here. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we will have Lourdes give, his, uh, give her keynote in a couple of minutes. But um, let me drive you through the schedule a little bit. Um, you already in the, in the intro, you heard about the general schedule of CAV. Um, we first messed up a bit the starting time. So this is still the old, I should refresh. Um, so we, we always have a coffee break if you want to join really early. We then start with a conference welcome and we have amazing um, sponsors this year. They gonna gonna give a sponsor talk in, in every morning. And it's really interesting, it's research they're doing. So you really get a glimpse into what, what's happening inside these companies. So I recommend you joining. And then we're gonna have the three keynotes Lotus is starting at 8.10, always at the same time. So about an hour for the keynote, then coffee break, you, you went through it. So what I want to show you is that we have this um, overview here on uh, on the first page of the CRV uh, homepage. But you just scroll down, we also have the detailed program, which gives a little bit more detail of which papers are going to present it, and also the format. So um, all the oral sessions we have, five of them, they always start with a symposium speaker. So um, either an established researcher or a junior researcher, but um, uh, on a rising rising uh, track. They're gonna give a 12 minute presentation and three minutes Q and A. And then we have the oral presentations with seven minutes, seven minutes each. If you're really eager, you, you can ask a question during the talk as well. We are relatively mid-sized uh, crew. So if it's something really urgent, then bring it up after the, the talk. But the main Q and A we wanna do afterwards in, in the batch mode. So I have three presentations and then the Q and A. And yeah, the rest you already have been uh, working through. Maybe what's worth to motion is, mention is the um, poster session we have in the end that's going to be on Gather Town. So um, you will have to join this virtual platform, which run, runs in your browser. So nothing to install anything. Um, you just walk around with your arrow keys and then can visit the posters. We expect the poster presenters to be right next to the poster. And you can interact with the poster by pressing X. So walk close to it and then pressing X. There's also the sponsors the talk you just saw. So we might have a representative from them too. If you have other questions, that's a good good time to reach out to them. And um, yeah, because it's a couple of links we have, I um, composited them all in one, one file. So I will just post that here in chat. Um, and yeah, you're gonna have all the links, including also the proceedings of CAB. If you get interested after the talk, you can um, follow up and uh, reach in there. 
yeah, and I recommend you to try out this Gazetown already. Uh, probably not during the keynote, but right after in the coffee break, we can use that also to uh, hang out. How this platform works is that you can roughly talk to people half a screen away. Or if you go into these private places, just the poster, you will only talk to the people for the poster. If you want to have a private conversation with somebody, you can also go in these private rooms here to the bottom, uh, these colored areas. Then you can just talk to the people there. So yeah, a, a brief intro. Let me know if you face any issues joining this. Please try it out uh, before the poster session. It's just one hour. And if you have any trouble, reach out to me so we can troubleshoot. But um, the biggest issue is if you're on a VPN, sometimes things don't work as, as intended. So, um, but yeah, we, we can troubleshoot. All right, yeah, th these are the main things I wanted to mention. And um, yeah, reach out to us if, if you have any questions about this. And yeah, then I will slowly hand over to Lourdes. So I will stop sharing. She can start. And of course, I will do the usual introduction. So let me pull up my notes so I don't miss any details about Lotus. Um, yeah, so it's my pleasure to have you here, Lotus, today. Um, she is a full professor at UCL, uh, University College London. So we're joining over from Europe. Um, thanks, thanks for doing that. We had some issues even with the time zones. I sent her the wrong time zone. So thanks a lot, Lotus, for still making it uh, short notice till the right time. And um, yeah, big thanks for that. So Lotus has been at many, uh, she, she is an established researcher. She, she is leading the field in monocular three reconstruction, uh, you could say, or she is, is a leader for sure. Um, she has been at many places. She has been at Cree Mary University. She has done a postdoc at Oxford. Um, so she, she knows her way around. And currently she's leading the vision and image science group at UCL. She's also a founding member of the AI center and a co-director of the Center for Doctoral Training and Foundation of AI. So she also cares a lot about students, does a lot of community work for us. So she was and will be a program chair for CUPR and ICCD. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot I, I could tell uh, you about Lotus and her career. career, quite impressive. One other thing to mention is that apparently this academic career, which is going great for her, is not enough. So she also co-founded Synthesia uh, in 2017, I believe it's already five years. And it's an amazing startup. Um, she, I believe she will give you a glimpse in that as well, but essentially they are creating virtual humans. So for instance, they could make Beckham speak nine different languages to call on world leaders to take actions to defeat malaria. Quite impressive. Uh, so I hope you see some, some footage from that as well. And yeah, I, in general, I, I don't wanna hold you off further. So um, let's slowly hand it over to her. Uh, I know Lotus from a talk at MPI, she probably gave, I don't know, 10 years ago. Yeah. And she's she's very a very modest person. So in case she just talks about casually about her projects, um, a lot of the things she had been doing, I deemed impossible before. So really, um, uh, I pre appreciate uh, your work. And um, yeah, I'm glad you can share today to, to this audience. So take the, the stage and I'm looking forward to hearing your most recent developments. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Helga. That's a, that's a really nice introduction, actually. Um, yeah, so it's it's a real it's a real pleasure for me to be here today. Um, so yeah, uh, Helga contacted me a, a few months ago to ask me if I would give a a, a keynote at this conference, and uh, it, it's a real it's a real pleasure. It's a I, I'm I'm very sorry that I can't be there in person, um, but you know, I think I think uh, hopefully you'll get um, you'll get some uh, you'll get a good perspective about three D vision during my talk. Um, yeah, so yeah, so so it's it's true. So I've been working in this field of uh, of deformable uh, shape analysis uh, and reconstruction from monocular sequences of uh, deformable objects for for many years, um, and. You know, I've found this world of, of 3D computer vision really fascinating and probably the, the most exciting and challenging problem in, in computer vision. Um, so it's, it's really about how we build 3D representations of the world. Um, and these representations, we want them to be 3D aware and we want to build them just from images or from videos that have been taken from a single camera. That, that's mostly the um, the, the bulk of my of my research. And this comes really from a, 
um, I mean, I, I like the, the title of this conference, right? It's uh, Robots and Vision. Um, and my work has really been a little bit at the intersection of, of these fields, also computer graphics, but the, these two fields where, you know, we're not, we're not just reconstructing the world for the sake of it, uh, but we, we want to make meaningful representations that can be later used by, by robots. And this is actually something that is extremely hard. And I think that we've, we've probably got quite good at the, at the reconstruction part. Uh, we've got quite good at the synthesis part. We're still really very, very far from having very good solutions for, uh, for robots to interact with, with objects and to interact with the geometry in a, in a really flexible way and in a really intelligent way. So I think you know, there's an enormous amount of work in, in this field that still needs to be done. Um, so I hope, I hope it's not too noisy, but my office is in central London, so <laughs> there might be some background noise. It's all right, it's not noticeable. Uh, okay, um, great. So what I really want to take you through today is, is mostly, uh, as I said, you know, learning representations of the world from images or from monocular sequences, but really looking at how pivotal machine learning has been for this field. Um, so I want to give you a bit of a, of a flavor of, of how hard this problem is by, by looking at images like this. So when we look at these images, uh, you know, an image like this, it's very complex, but as humans, we just get an instant sense of 3D understanding. Um, you know, we, we, we really understand the layout of the scene just, just by opening our eyes. So some of it is purely geometric. So perspective is helping us to understand the layout of this busy market. Um, and we can instantly infer what's close and what's far away. Um, but a lot of our understanding is by a, our prior knowledge. So we know roughly what the shape, color and texture of different fruits and vegetables is. Um, and we could tell how far a person would have to reach to pick up some tomatoes or how heavy a pumpkin might feel in our hands. Right, so we use so much prior knowledge uh, to solve this task that, you know, you would think that 3D understanding seems like a perfect task for, for a machine learning algorithm. Um, but when we look at the large computer vision data sets that have been collected over the years uh, for image recognition and, and detection tasks, it turns out that they have only got 2D annotations or mostly 2D annotations. Um, right, so how, how do we, how do we actually solve this problem? So the, the 2D annotations that we typically have will be class labels. So we'll know, you know what, what sort of objects there are in the, in the image. We might have masks, key points, because these are really relatively cheap and easy, very easy to annotate. You don't even need experts. But actually aligning images with accurate 3D shapes, uh, such as meshes like this, is extremely hard and expensive. So although there have been some efforts um, and you know, more and more efforts of collecting data sets that do have 3D annotations, such as ScanNet or, or Matterport, they're, they're quite limited to indoor scenes and you know, also limited very often to, to uh, static scenes, not dynamic scenes. Um, so, you know, if we think about the easy way to go about solving this problem, which would be a fully supervised approach based on 3D losses, um, you know, we would need to have every image aligned with a 3D mesh. So, you know, this is actually completely out of the question. Um, but it does turn out that we have actually solved this problem of 3D reconstruction from weak annotations or even no 3D annotations at all. And we've, we've actually solved this problem before and we are actually really good at it. <laughs> so if we look back at old school computer vision and, and we look at uh, old school geometric methods for 3D reconstruction, they're in essence weakly supervised methods or, or self-supervised methods in many cases. So for instance, one of the big successes in the era of geometric computer vision was structure from motion, where we would take as input a collection of images, we would extract some point features and establish correspondences uh, across those features, as you can see here. Um, and then we would estimate the parameters of our 3D representation which in this case are the 3D coordinates of the world points and the camera poses, such that when we project them back onto the images, 
we get back our observations, which are the 2D points, the, the reprojected map points. So, you know, these, uh, this reconstruction agrees with our observations when we project it back on the images. So we're learning a 3D representation, but our loss is purely 2D. There's no 3D annotations at all. Another example is multi-view stereo. So here our observations are the actual images themselves. There is no feature extraction or no point extraction initially. And the problem that we're solving is, can we reconstruct a dense 3D mesh such that when we re-render our estimate back onto the images, our synthesized observations agree with our input images. So they're essentially the same. So this methodology is also called analysis by synthesis, and it, it's really been the driving force of, uh, of 3D reconstruction. Um, and to do this, we essentially use a photometric loss to guide the estimation of the depth of each point. So the intensity of the corresponding points uh, should be the same. Um, and so there are no 3D annotations here either. So these two examples that I've chosen, the example of uh, structure from motion and multi-view stereo, the inference of the parameters of the 3D representation is done via optimization. But the intuition here is that we could also use neural networks for the inference uh, of the intermediate representation, this uh, what, what we show here in green, given that our loss in this case is being able to resynthesize the, the original images. So this analysis by, by synthesis uh, 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 methodology is, is, is extremely powerful in the sense that you know, we, can, we can kind of substitute these boxes, that the, the representation can either be an explicit representation or it can be an implicit representation. It can be even a neural network that's representing our scene. Um, and we can also, for instance, change the rendering. We can have a neural rendering or we can have traditional uh, rendering operations. Um, but ultimately, this kind of methodology of synthesizing back our observations and making sure that they match um, and optimizing the parameters is, is, is always the same. And it has been incredibly powerful. So now a world of options opens up, right? So as I said before, one of the things that we need to decide is which representation are we going to use? What sort of 3D representation? Are we going to use an explicit representation such as a discrete voxel grid? Uh, how, uh, how dense is it going to be? Um, and you know, the advantage of it is that it can be processed nicely with 3D convolutions. Uh, or should we go for, for a point cloud, uh, which is lightweight and it's, uh, it's, it's a very nice way of representing uh, geometry uh, or meshes, or we could also use implicit representations uh, such as sine distance functions, which are continuous representation. Um, an even more exciting current trend is, as I, I said before, is to represent the scene via a fully connected network. So where we query the network, at each 3D point location to give us, for instance, the occupancy. So what is the occupancy at that particular point? Um, so we also can, you know, we have many options in terms of what image formation models we, we're going to use. So for instance, we can use perspective uh, geometry or we can use, um, we can use orthographic, uh, orth an orthographic uh, camera model. Uh, or we can only, for instance, represent geometry or model the geometry, or we could also care about things like lighting and material properties, um, etc. So the image formation models are also, you know, that there's a big choice there of how, what, what sort of models we're going to use, um, or which observations we're going to use. Um, for instance, we can, you know, use key points as observations or just use masks or depth maps or, or the images themselves. Um, and as I said before, we can also choose in terms of annotations, what annotations are we going to use? And in all my talk, I'm, I'm always going to prioritize either 2D, so we call these weak, weak annotations because they don't require any kind of 3D annotations or self-supervised methods that don't even need any annotations at all. Um, Whereas, you know, we, we wouldn't really want to go down the route of, of having full 3D annotations. That's not really what we like. <laughs> so 
Um, okay, so so far I've talked about capturing um, capturing a, a static world, right? So we've talked about you know we've got a collection of images, they're all looking at the same scene, and how do we go about reconstructing? Um, but you know, capturing a static world only take us takes us so far. So you know, here I've got some some nice kind of 3D models of the, these are my my children quite a few years ago. We've scanned them with with a with a Kinect camera, and we made these 3D models and and printed printed them. But obviously, they don't represent any of the dynamics, right? So. We also want to capture dynamics. We want to learn 3D representations that can explain not just a single instant in time, um, but you know, also every possible deformation, every configuration. So this is really the main topic of my research. How can we learn 3D deformable models that can explain how the shapes and ob of, of objects evolve over time or how they vary across a category, for instance and to learn this directly from images. So this reconstruction that you see here on the left was, was done from just, just the, the video that you see on the right. So a single camera and we can get 3D. Um, so as, as Helga said, said before, this, this video is actually quite old. This is from about 2015 or 16, something like that. So, you know, we have been working on this field for, for a very long time. And I think that, you know, for a keynote, I think it's, interesting to kind of go back and see how how did we solve these problems and in some ways you know we're now using more maybe more more um, modern representations uh, we, we we're using machine learning to to supplement our observations but ultimately I think maybe my message throughout this keynote is that ultimately the the losses and the the, the models that we're using are actually very very similar um, and we have actually solved these problems in a, in, in a very similar form before. Um, okay, so this brings me to one more element of our 3D representation. So, so far we were talking about, uh, we were talking about uh, rigid objects, but when we start to think about the variations of shape across the categories, so for instance, the category, the category of, uh, of faces or chairs or cars or human bodies, um, or deformations of, of, of a face or a human body, we need to also think about, sh about shape priors. Um, so th they encapsulate the variations, the possible variations of the shape across the category. And typically what tends to happen mostly in the field is that these are usually pre-trained from thousands of 3D scans. So this is, this is where the, the 3D data comes in. Um, or the 3D, uh, the, the 3D annotations, let's say. Um, so completely working in 3D, what you do is that you, you build, uh, you pre-train a, a prior model. So these models are usually parametric, such as 3D morphable models for faces, um, or for instance, the simple model that many of you will know for to represent the deformations of uh, shape and, and also the deformations of the, the articulations of the body. Um, but others are neural representations that encapsulate in their weights um, the, the possibility, the possible deformations of, of objects across a category. So then the idea is that, you know, we have, we pre-train our 3D priors, we pre-train our 3D model, and then at test time, we might have the single image and our job is then to fit the parameters of our model to the current observations, where the observations are, are, might be just a single image. So really the, the question that you know, I often want to ask myself is, you know, can, we, can we actually learn these shape priors directly from image? So instead of needing to have these collections of 3D shapes, that need an enormous amount of work in advance because we usually need to align them. Uh, there, there's, we need to establish correspondences between them. So can we avoid all of that work by learning these shape priors directly from images? So without having to capture these data sets in 3D. Um, so again, I'm gonna take you back to 2013 now. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna show you a way in which we tackled this problem. Um, 
So this is work from CVPR 13, and this was the, the, the first monocular, the, the first dense monocular uh, re deformable reconstruction algorithm that appeared. Um, and here the idea was that we were given a single video of, uh, or sequence of a deforming object um, taken from a single viewpoint. And the, and the goal is to reconstruct a dense per pixel model for every frame of the sequence. So the input is monocular video. The output is a, a reconstruction for every single frame of the sequence. Um, so this is, this is kind of the goal. So per pixel model, and we also want to know the relative orientation of the face with respect to the camera. So what were our observations? So in this case, we kind of decoupled the problem of finding the correspondences between the points and the 3D reconstruction. And what we did was that we took the original video and we tracked all of the pixels in the image over the entire sequence. So our observations are the 2D point trajectories over time. So we could call this multi-frame optical flow. So the idea is that we are tracking consistently over time the point. So there's, uh, there's you can see that the, the, the mesh is, is completely stuck to the face. And this is this is 2D, 2D tracking, right? So we we first had a go at this problem of, you know, let's first do this hard thing of, of tracking all the points and then we work on the reconstruction. So once we had those observations, uh, the, the the key points tracked in a, in every in every frame of the sequence, we we want to reconstruct a model such that the same thing, right? When we project it back on camera, we get our observations back. In other words, the three D points we project back onto the tracks. But this is not enough for deformable shapes. Uh, there would be an infinite number of possible shapes that could represent that could reproject onto the same measurements. So we need to add a, a prior here. And the prior that we used um, was that what we wanted is that if we take the, the reconstructed shapes over the entire sequence, we know that they should lie in setting. And we impose this by minimizing the trace norm of the reconstructions. So what we're doing is we're trying to explain the reconstructions for every frame in the sequence. So these are now the 3D, the 3D uh, shapes across the sequence. We want to explain them with as few components as possible. So effectively, we're kind of like pushing all of the information into as few components as we can. And we do that by minimizing the um, This would be the, the mathematical form of, of our optimization. So effectively K, which is the, the final rank that we estimate should be a lot smaller than the number of frames. Essentially what we're saying is that the shape at each frame can be explained as a linear combination of some basis shapes. But here the, the key thing is that this, this basis is actually unknown. So we're estimating jointly the, the, the low rank basis and also the coefficients. So rather than training on lots of 3D data our basis in advance and then fitting, finding out the weights, we try to learn everything jointly. Um, and you know, this becomes a, one of these big optimization problems where we are after uh, the shapes in every frame and also the orientation of the camera relative to the face for every frame. Um, and our loss is going to be, as I said before, a reprojection error. That's the first error that you see here. We want our measurements to reproject back where we, where we measured them in the image. We have a total variation smoothness prior over the surface, the low rank prior for the 3D reconstructions. And, um, and this is enough to actually get you know, pretty, pretty good results um, like this. Um, so again, you know, remember this was like, yeah, almost 10 years ago, <laughs> a long time ago. Um, so this is, you know, one of the very first examples of monocular RGB only uh, 3D reconstruction. Um, the beauty of this method or the advantage is that we can reconstruct any shape because we are learning the low rank representation directly from the 2D data. So we were able to also use um, data like this. So from medical imaging, we could we could reconstruct a beating heart, etc. 
Okay, but remember that we decoupled the estimation of the correspondences and the 3D shape reconstruction. So instead in, in 2015, we then proposed a direct method that estimates um, a deformation field, uh, a dense deformation field directly from images. So the idea is that we would have again, a video, a monocular video taken from a single viewpoint and we had an initial estimate of the 3D of the 3D shape, and this is like a we could call it a sometimes we would call it a canonical shape. And what we want is to then estimate warp field that would deform that template or that canonical shape back to to the current frame, such that when we render that deformed mesh, um, we actually get our observations back. So what we're doing is that we're minimizing this photometric loss um, to estimate the warp field that will give us the best possible render that matches our, our observations. Um, so um, this is a per pixel dense model to frame photometric loss. This is this is how we um, how we uh, formulated it. Um, we also need to have again some some uh, regularization priors, and here we had uh, we were trying to preserve local rigidity, to preserve detail, and preserve also spatial smoothness. So we had an Arab term and a total variation term, and again this was uh, a big optimization. <laughs> it looks a bit like this. But you know, if you if you if you look at the losses that that we're using now with the, you know with neural rendering and things like this, we're using exactly exactly the same losses. Um, so I think it's you know it's interesting to see that you know perhaps our representations have changed a bit, um, but you know the optimizations that we're running are very are very similar, and the way that we use the data is quite different. But essentially the losses and the optimizations are very similar. Um, and again, these were the reconstructions that, that we could get. Now, the advantage of this method is that now, instead of having to take all of the frames at once to reconstruct the entire sequence, we were actually reconstructing every frame one by one. So in a sequential way. So we had, uh, we had the shape, uh, we had a new frame that came in and we were estimating the deformations with respect to the to the previous frame. And as you can see, you know, we could we could we could track many different types of objects. So you saw a few different toys and faces and, and even hands. Here you can see the 3D flow, which is which is quite consistent. OK, so. Um, so this is nice when we're looking at objects for which we don't have enough training data to pre-train a prior. Um, but you know, if we if we're completely kind of honest, uh, in some cases, such as the case of the human face, these models actually exist, right? So we do have a lot of training data, um, and they can be used for tracking. So now you know we go back to the formulation I was talking about at the beginning we can pre-train uh, a model on, let's say, thousands or, or tens of thousands of 3D scans of people. We might also have the, the texture. Uh, so we have textured 3D scans. And we can, we can actually learn a PCA shape uh, expression uh, texture model. We can even learn, a, we can even par parametrize the, the changes in, in illumination as well. Um, so we have this parametric model. So this would be a model-based uh, face tracking algorithm instead. And at inference time, the idea, as I said before, is that we get a, a new frame, we get a new image, and we optimize photometric loss to estimate the model parameters. And the model parameters are the pose of the head, um, the shape or the identity of the person, um, the albedo, so the texture of the face, the illumination and the and the expression and these are these are parameters. We might just have you know, let's say uh, two hundred parameters or something like that to represent uh, to represent a face. Um, and the idea is exactly the same. You know, we then synthesize the images to get back the same observations. That that's these photometric losses are what uh, drives the, this three D estimation all the time. 
So this modeling actually works incredibly well. So when we resynthesize the observations using the estimated model, so here you can see this is this is David Beckham. He's a well, he used to be a famous footballer. He's now I don't know one of these celebrities, um, and we are fitting the three D morphable model to his face. And what you see in yellow here, this this uh, this image here is the is the re rendered model. Um, so we've resynthesized the observations using our estimations of the model. So the errors are actually quite small. So we can really model the, uh, the, the images uh, really well. So um, as Helge said, um, you know, the, what, what we observed at the time was that the fact that we're modeling the face so accurately in 3D, it actually means that we can later edit the parameters, we can change the parameters in 3D, and we can resynthesize new movements for the face. So uh, in 2017, we saw an incredible opportunity to start up a company with a mission to empower users to make video content and to be able to synthesize images without of, of faces, without cameras, microphones, or studios. The idea is that you know, we would be able to, to synthesize uh, in, a, in a much easier way. So what we started with was uh, video to video transfer. So we would have uh, one, uh, one input uh, video, uh, and this would be like the driving video. So we would have a, a, an actor, let's say, who was talking, let's say in Portuguese. Um, and what we wanted to do was resynthesize the output video, reanimate that, uh, that had maybe maybe this person was talking in English and we wanted to remap the motion of the of the mouth so that it looked like the person was actually speaking a different language. Um, so we so this is really face to face to face transfer or, or video to video transfer. Um, so we we started up Synthesia in 2017, as Helga was saying, um, and our first public facing project was this one that you're going to see. I hope you can hear the sound, yes. Malaria isn't just any disease. It's the deadliest disease there's ever been. Se dice que ha matado más de la mitad de la población que ha existido. Video de Miron Gutan, what is we? Wa ma zala taqtul tiflan kull daqiqatayn. Nous nous pouvons y mettre fin. Nous savons comment, nous en avons la possibilité. Ma me ora di karbaik izadrat. Speak up and say malaria must. Okay. Okay, so um, of course Beckham doesn't speak any of those languages. Uh, what we did here was to track other uh, actors who were speaking in their own languages. Uh, and in fact, these these languages are languages from from countries where malaria is a, is a big killer. Um, so this was a, a, a very special project for us to do. Um, so we track the motion in the input actors and the source actors, and we then um, mapped it onto onto Beckham's face and then resynthesized the the new video. Um, but of course. Um, even even more exciting is that is that now we don't actually need to have two videos. We need, don't need to have a source video and a target video. Now we can generate the three D lip motion parameters directly from uh, from text uh, and from from speech. Um, so you can just type in the words that you want and uh, choose one of our avatars. And you can then synthesize video saying exactly what you've typed in. And I mean, if you go to our website, you can any any of you can can try this. You can you can all try it. You can do a demo sort of for free. So here is a one I've I've done before. I'm excited to be here to demonstrate how Synthesia allows you to make videos simply by typing text. The reason it works so well is that my face is modeled in 3D. I'm excited to be here. Okay, so you know it, it, it's it's true that that um, you know the realism is is incredible, and it's really you know it, it it really is all powered by by the fact that we're modeling everything in 
um, in 3D. Of course, there, there, are, there are GANs that are helping us to, for instance, fill in the parts of the, of the face that, that, we're not, that we're not modeling, such as the, the teeth or, or um, other parts that we're not actually modeling. Um, but you know, most of the most of the work is done by by being able to to represent uh, to to have a a very faithful three uh, D representation and a representation that's editable. So we have parameters that we can change so that we can you know alter the alter the motion of the lips, etc. Um, yeah. So now you know we have uh, we now we have thousands of, of customers and uh, we the companies now we have about 100 employees so we've we've grown a lot in in five years and you know this is a, a very exciting moment i think for for computer vision the fact that you know every, everything that we're doing is now something that that we can you know we, we can we can help companies create these videos in a very simple way especially during the pandemic for instance where it was almost impossible to go to a studio uh, to capture video and to create uh, training, for instance, training videos for employees. Um, in in that, that sense, you know, we we made it easy to just type in the text, and then you know we can produce the videos. And um, you know, another another important thing for us is that um, it, it's all it's all sort of um, surrounded by that we we take ethical uh, issues very. Uh, very seriously, so you know we will never re-enact anyone who hasn't given their own consent. Uh, and uh, and I think that you know the fact that we have bolstered everything with with ethical principles is is another really important thing for the for the field as well. Okay, so um, I'm now going to go into a, a slightly different topic. So we've seen how embedding 3D shapes in into 3D reconstruction of deformable objects works really well. So we're now going to move on to representing full scenes, and um, and this is this this work is is perhaps you know, more more useful for people working in robotics. So um, now what we want is to to represent full scenes and to in a way where we are exposing information about the scene and tree um, but we are representing scenes at the level of objects so we call this object aware scene representations um, really where recognition meets uh, 3d reconstruction so a thing that has been very successful is is this to represent scenes at the level of objects uh, where we don't just represent the scene as a bunch of 3D points, we also label them with with semantic labels, and then you know we we have ways of you know knowing that this particular mesh corresponds uh, to a chair, so then someone can sit on it. So you know we can associate um, we can associate meaning to objects. Uh, so I'm going to talk briefly about about two different two different works. So on the left, um, this is mask fusion. So this is a paper from 2018 from uh, Martin Runtz, uh, who was one of my students. Um, and here, what we were doing was was to do. You can see it here. So we had a, an RGBD camera. So it wasn't just RGB. We also had a depth channel, and we were doing SLAM. So we were doing. 3D reconstruction and camera pose estimation, simultaneous uh, localization and mapping. But the other thing that we were doing is that we were uh, we were taking uh, we were taking advantage of the, of, of running uh, um, a semantic segmentation, uh, an instance level semantic segmentation algorithm that could give us masks and labels for all the objects present in the scene, and then we could transfer these labels in consistent, temporally consistent way. Uh, onto the 3D model, um, and in that way, we would get a temporally consistent uh, semantic model. And something that you might or might not have seen is that um, this is actually a dynamic scene. So the camera is moving, but also at some point, someone picks up an object and starts moving it around. And because we are representing the objects uh, independently, then we're able to track and estimate the sixth off pose of the object of the objects also independently. 
Um, so this is, you know, it's mask fusion. I mean, it's it's uh, semantic, but it's also dynamic. Um, but of course, um, something that we something that that we didn't do at that point was to actually use uh, shape priors when we were reconstructing the objects. When we reconstructed the objects, um, we didn't use any prior information or any uh, any uh, shape information about what we were reconstructing. We were literally just reconstructing well circles in in that case. So when we move to the example on the right where we reconstruct each object also as a, as a complete shape, even when we have partial observations. So that's the power of using uh, shape priors that because we have pre-trained these shape priors before, we have actually seen all the geometry of the objects and we can then fit them to partial observations. So in this case, uh, we're using a pre-learned 3D shape prior for each object category. And we take advantage of a very well, relatively novel way. This field is moving so quickly that um, to represent shapes in a very, very compact way. So in 2019, this same idea was developed in parallel by a few different groups to use fully connected networks uh, to represent shapes in a continuous way. And the idea is that we, uh, we query uh, an XYZ 3D point location uh, to the network and it returns a value that's re related to the geometry of the shape. So it could be the occupancy um, or it could be, for instance, the SDF, the sign distance uh, value. Um, so this one is the one that we used. Uh, this is deep SDF and the network returns the distance to the closest point on the surface. And these representations can be pre-trained from 3D data. So we we actually in 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 this in this work that I'm going to talk about now, um, in um, in Frodo, what we did was that we pre-trained we used a pre-trained deep SDF model on chairs, for instance, um, and then the way that this architecture works is that so deep SDF is is an auto decoder at training time the weights of the decoder are learned. Mm -hmm. But you also, at the same time, are learning an embedding of latent codes where each training shape is assigned a different code in the embedding. And at test time, you can have in an incomplete uh, point cloud, for instance, or a depth map. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, a depth map or in incomplete observations. And then you freeze the network, and the idea is you know, can you? Uh, optimize the code um, such that you know you you fit to your to your measurements, right? So you fit the the weights of the decoder, and the optimization gives you back the code uh, that leads to the shape that most agrees with your current observations. Um, so this is deep SDF, and what we did was that we uh, you know, we kind of asked ourselves, could we estimate these shape code vectors just from images instead of from depth data. So the way that deep SDF, just for clarity, the way that deep SDF works is that it needs uh, depth measurements or a partial point cloud as input. So we wanted to estimate the shape codes directly from images. Um, so here is, here is what, what we did. So the input is a sequence we're using uh, we're using deep SDF as our as our embedding, um, and we operated in four steps. So first of all, we detected uh, the the objects in in the images. So we used a, a detection algorithm that gave us the bounding box, and using these bounding box, we could lift them into three D. So then we have a three D bounding box that tells us the orientation and the position of the of the object, and then. Now we use all the images to infer the code that best explains um, our observations. Um, so this is one of the one of the scenes um, from ScanNet, which is a, a real world. Uh, the real world sequences taken uh, in people's houses, so indoor sequences 
And these are the kinds of um, reconstructions that we got. So again, uh, the optimization or the, the, the methodologies and analysis by synthesis optimization. So we have a current estimate of the shape code and the pose of the object. And what we're doing is that we decode that um, and using the deep SDF prior, uh, and then we had a photometric term. We also had uh, a sparse point cloud and a silhouette term to drive the optimization. So again, you know, we synthesize the um, the we we synthesize the images. Uh, we also reprojected the 3D points onto 2D to have a 2D loss, and we had a silhouette loss as well. So all the losses are 2D losses and the photometric loss. Um, and these were the kinds of reconstructions that, that we could get. So uh, these are the RGB images, and here are our reconstructions on the right, and you can see that they're pretty close to the ground truth scans. Um, and yeah, we got pretty kind of nice results on sequences that are incredibly hard to reconstruct such as uh, such as ScanNet. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in, in this, you can have a, a quick look at, at the paper. Um, so something that we did afterwards is that, you know, we also realized that we could use this same reconstructions uh, strategy, but embed it within a, a SLAM system. So in the previous work, we were estimating the, the poses of the cameras first. We did that as a, as a, as a you know, pre-estimation. And here we're actually doing everything jointly. So we have a sparse SLAM backbone. Um, and then we're actually reconstructing the detected objects, uh, the detected objects, and then we're building uh, a pose graph or a factor graph where we're jointly estimating the positions of the cameras, the camera poses, and the um, and the and the object uh, the object poses, and also some sparse points in the scene. So this is work from last year from 3D. Um, you can see a video here. So these are the kind of so this we we evaluated on on Kitty on the Kitty data set. So you can see here, these images are, uh, uh, these were the input images. In this case, we use, we use stereo. Um, we can also use monocular and I'll, I'll show you afterwards. So these are, this is the, the stereo input from Kitty. Uh, these are the, the key points that are extracted for, for the kind of backbone SLAM system. And you can see here that we're building a map, not just of features, but also the cars start appearing and their shape and their orientation is actually estimated nicely. Um, and the nice thing about this method is that, so I'm gonna go through it a bit more quickly. Um, the nice thing is that what you end up with at the end is a, is a very rich map where you can see it here, right? So you can see that we don't just have, you know, sparse point clouds, we actually have all the cars uh, that we've reconstructed. Um, and we have dense reconstructions for the cars. So another exciting thing is that we can also run this with a monocular sequence. So here you have these, these we, we're using these uh, sparse points, we track the position of the camera, and then we're fitting uh, the uh, SDF, the deep SDF latents to these kind of sparse uh, depth observations or 3D point cloud observations. That, that's what we're doing. Um, so you can see that the camera is going round and this all works in real time. So um, that's another nice aspect of this method. So we can do cars, we can also, you can see in the next video that we can also fit to chairs as well. So, you know, we can, we can get really nice 3D models and we can also, uh, we can also track the positions of the camera simultaneously. Okay, so I'm just maybe to the last um, the last uh, piece of work that I'm going to talk about. Um, so in so far we've talked about how to use 
neural representations, the geometry of, of objects, right? And, um, but what about using a neural representation to represent the entire scene? And uh, I guess everyone in the room knows about NERF, this recent landmark paper that takes this idea of using fully connected neural networks as a continuous representation of a 3D scene even further. And now showed how this can be trained just from images. So there's no 3D data here. Um, the training data here is just input images. Um, so the idea is that it's quite simple. You take a, a set of input images with known camera poses. So the camera poses are known and you then learn the weights of a network that's trained to re-render all of these images. Um, and then at test time, this pre-trained network can be used, you can freeze the network, and then you can feed in a new viewpoint and you can render, uh, it can be used to render new views from unseen viewpoints. So, you know, this works amazingly well, the results of the it, inferred depth maps got everyone super hooked um, and the reason why it works so well is that you know in essence it's really multi-view photo consistency right it's exactly what we were talking about before um, so the internal representation is trained using multi-view photo consistency um, so NERF represents the scene as a network and it takes in the xyz location of a point and the viewing direction from which it's observed um, and that's kind of represented by, by the rays here. Um, and the output of the network is the color of the point and its de density. Um, and then volume rendering is used to infer the radiance of each pixel. Um, and volume rendering takes all the point samples along the ray and integrates their colors weighed by their density. So, you know, but again, the loss is the same thing. It's the photometric loss that we've been talking about all the time. Um, so kind of the clever thing here is to, instead of having an explicit representation where we might have a mesh or a point cloud, the clever thing here is that the, the representation is a neural representation. It's a neural network that uh, takes in an XYZ uh, location and the viewing direction from which we viewing it from and outputs RGB and density. Um, so now the point is that, you know, as cool as this is, an issue is that it has to be trained from scratch for every new scene. And, you know, you all know that it also takes rather a long time to actually <laughs> optimize um, NERF. So instead, what we wanted to do was, you know, we, we were still keen to, to model the variations of shape and texture across a category. And we wanted to generalize not just to unseen viewpoints, but also to unseen objects uh, from the same class. And so our recent work, uh, Code Nerf, which appeared at ICCV last year, this is exactly what we did. And what we've seen before throughout this talk is that we need to learn a shape embedding or prior that encapsulates the variation of shape across a category. So we kind of took inspiration from DeepSDF and we represent the scene using an auto decoder. So this is the auto decoder that takes in, you know, the XYZ position, the viewing direction, but it also takes, uh, it also learns simultaneously two latent embeddings. So one to represent the shape and the other one to represent the texture. And then in this way, we can disentangle both latent spaces during training and at test time, we can then edit also shapes or we can edit the textures independently. So the rest of the pipeline is, is similar to enough. We also use volume rendering to resynthesize the training images. But as I said, at test time, we're given a single input image of an unknown object in an unknown pose. And what we can do is estimate the shape code, the texture code, and also the camera pose. This is quite, quite new or quite novel with respect to other, other approaches that had to, that needed to know the camera pose at, at test time as well. Um, so we could optimize shape code, texture code, and camera pose. Um, and at test time, we run this optimization uh, to minimize the, the photometric loss. Um, so here is, you know, the, the test time optimization happening. So we, we start 
you know, sometimes we start quite far away. Um, you can see it here. So here we, you have, um, this is the image. These are the input images we show four examples. This would be the input image and the initialization. We start with a car that doesn't look anything. So a latent code that doesn't look anything like the final car. Uh, it's like an average car and the pose is also quite far away. And here you can see the evolution of the estimated renderings throughout the optimization steps. So you know, we're estimating the shape codes, the late, the texture codes, and also the poses. Um, and you can see that you know some of the high frequency details are appearing towards the end, and it converges in in you know few iterations. So this is the final result. And then afterwards, what we can do is that we can do novel view synthesis. Um, but what's really cool is that we can do more than that. So we can now, we have our reference shape and what we could do is that we can uh, fix the shape and we can edit the texture. You just maybe saw it a bit too quickly. We can edit the texture by providing a different image that will, that will have the appropriate latent um we can do this for chairs as well so we we keep the shape fixed and we edit the texture or we do the other way around we keep the texture fixed and we can vary the the shape so we can have red cars with multiple different uh, shapes um and of course the other thing that we can do is that we can interpolate in texture space or here you can see how we can interpolate in in shape space as well so these are interpolations. And here you can see on the top, you can see the intermediate target shapes or target textures. So it's really cool because, you know, we can now have, we, we now have uh, parameters, we now have handles on, on, uh, on uh, and we can synthesize, um, which, is, which is cool. Um, and again, the other thing that we can do is that we can do single view reconstruction, right? So, when we have a single image, we just run our optimization and we can output these uh, 3D meshes and we can estimate the, the pose and the, and the shape and we get a 3D colored mesh. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up now. So, you know, I've, I've told you a little bit about, you know, about uh, NERF or object categories. There's, there's other concurrent work, there was this what called pixel nerf that also tries to to um, to reconstruct uh, or to to uh, to learn radiance fields from just two or three input images so to be able to to generalize uh, nicely. Others are focused on extending nerf to deal with deformations uh, such as faces or bodies. Uh, Others are focused on disentangling geometry, lighting and materials. Others have tried to do this in real time. So learn uh, a radiance field in, in real time. Um, and so, you know, the community has been extremely busy. I mean, there, there's so many more that, that I can't even fill them. <laughs> I would need about hundred slides to talk about everything that's happening in this world at the moment in this world of nerf I mean. um, but as i said before you know i i i i've recently been involved in in robotics projects and uh you know for me what's next in in 3d vision um i think we you know as you can see from from these recent works we've uh, or, or you know from the things we do at, at synthesia and our company i think we've got really good at you know reconstructing and using those reconstructions for things like synthesis, that, that's something that, you know, we have actually got really good at it. But reconstructing uh, the 3D world and, and making representations that are really useful for, for robots to be able to manipulate objects, to, uh, to, to move around the room, uh, to find meaningful things. Um, I think we're still very, very far away from this. You know, we need real time learning. We need to learn on the fly from very few examples. Uh, we also need to use other useful scene properties such as you know, grasping points or weights, affordances, safety issues. Um, 
we also have to be able to interact with humans, you know, and predict their intentions, anticipate their actions. Um, you know, a, a lot of amazing work has been done by by Helga, for instance, and his group on 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 human pose estimation. Um, so, you know, I think that we we still we still in in at the very very initial stages of being able to use these representations in a in a meaningful way um, so you know i think that 3d vision has a very very long way to go um, so yeah i just want to finish by thanking you know the people who've done a lot of hard work over the years and a, you know a team that i've enjoyed enormously working with um, and also some of the, the funding bodies and, and companies that have funded this research. So thanks a lot. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Lotus. <laughs> yeah, we, we started a bit late, so we are right at the end of, of the session, but we have a 15 minutes break. So I think we can still use that for, for questions if okay, anybody has. <laughs> um, we already have a question in the chat. I will read it out in a, sec a second. If you want to ask the question right away, then just put up your hand and uh, we can have a chat. I encourage you to also put up the video so we see each other a bit, uh, but of course up to you, depending on whether you're in a safe space or not. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so maybe let's start uh, with the question from Vida, um, asking mm -hmm. um, for the question on the earlier work, um, are the videos to 3D reconstructions, for example, the uh, stuffed animal dog done in real time? Mm -hmm. So is that all real time? Mm -hmm. Or does it need specialized hardware? Or what was used at the time? Yes. Yeah, so at the time, the only thing we used actually was what we are using now, right? A GPU. I mean, uh, it was, yeah, we, we, I mean, it was a lot harder in those days. I mean, we, you know, without PyTorch, you, you kind of had to often, you know, write down all the Jacobians and uh, maybe, you know, implement uh, uh, the kernel specifically um, to be able to optimize. But, but yeah, nothing, nothing more fancy than what we all have in our, in, on our computers these days, right? Just a, just a, yeah, just, just a GPU. So yeah, this was, this was something that was actually very, very important. Uh, I mean, there were, there was a very, you know, very, in, important work coming from uh, from groups in um, so Thomas Pock um, at the University of Graz and uh, Daniel Kramers as well so I mean they 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 started using GPUs for optimization of, of dense uh, dense optimization problems so using variational optimization and implementing it on on GPUs and um, yeah we kind of you know, we we really kind of tagged along with that, and um, yeah, and it was it was really a, a, a really big boost in in. I mean, this was happening in you know 20, 2010, 2011. Suddenly, um, you know, you could run optimization methods, you know, where maybe your costs were point wise, so you could then distribute everything on the GPU, and we were really making use of GPUs in a way. <laughs> that took real advantage of, of GPUs and we got incredible um, speed. So, yeah. And uh, part of the question was also uh, whether there's still limitations and may maybe you could answer it in uh, uh, yeah, context yeah, yeah, yeah. of what you're doing now. So what can yeah. we do better now with the neural approaches than back then? So there were limitations. Uh, so some of the limitations, I mean, uh, are obvious. We could, we could only actually reconstruct the scene that we had right because this was scene specific or the sequence that we had so you know we weren't necessarily able to then re-render with a with a very different uh deformation for instance so um i mean we you you can if if you've learned your your model in advance right so when you're doing model based tracking uh so if you use a 3d morphable model then you can actually re-render much more easily um, but not when you're learning the model simultaneously we we could a little bit but but you can't go too far from from the subspace that, that you've learned um, and it's just because you know you were learning from a single sequence um, so you know what we can do now is that we can throw in maybe more sequences and you know we can throw more data and learn from from more data um, something else that, you know, maybe is a, a little bit technical, but um, things like 
you know we you things like um the the topology you know uh, maybe the representation yeah you would learn it in a particular topology and you wouldn't be able to then uh i don't know with the fingers for instance you might not be able to to get the fingers to close properly that that's actually quite hard to do with these representations um yeah that i think that's that hits it quite well yeah F thanks a lot any any other questions i have plenty too <laughs> maybe i can start with a broad one um you, you've motivated it with parametric models and one advantage of them is that you get control as well right that, yeah. that's what you need for, for for your startup as well that you can put different words in, in somebody's mouth mm -hmm. um so you have this level of control what do you think of these very general methods now we see like clip or dali where you learn some of from text to images but there's no there's no 3d representation in there there's no shape yeah. explicit shape representation or anything yeah um, yeah yeah i mean I, I think i think it's absolutely fascinating and it, it just kind of blows you or blows you away <laughs> um yeah but but the, the, it it they're, they're, they find it very hard to, for instance, learn uh, 3D relations, right? So something is behind something else, or um, and I and I think that that's a really interesting challenge, you know, a very very interesting challenge for us to uh, to find representations that we can combine with language. I mean, I think I think this is, you know, if you go back to the the representations that we had where you represent the scene as you know nodes where each node is an object um you know, then you can you can represent relationships between the objects right uh what what can be i mean for instance a table you can put things on the top um they can support something else or other things have to always be on the floor so all these um i think that all of we need to we need to find ways of uh, i don't think we're done with building 3d representations right it's it's really the representation that's very 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 key and important mm -hmm. um and i think language probably gives you know there's there's good opportunities to combine language with with geometry as well and i mean there has been some work in that direction already but yeah this very nicely generative model um yeah. That, that's a nice perspective because sometimes I was myself even a bit worried that I work in very similar realms like you that yeah. um, it took me maybe a bit longer than you to figure out that essentially we're still doing the same with deep learning as with optimization before it's just different ways of optimizing <laughs> um, but then sometimes I wonder okay is this just an intermediate step and the more data we have the less structure we need to impose on them yeah, the less yeah. explicit multi-view you need and so on yeah that, but, that's um, a yeah. Uh, that that that's a very that's a very good point but but i think that you know we we've seen that these very kind of data hungry uh algorithms that are not really using maybe the the 3d priors uh in a clever way maybe you know they they take forever to optimize as mm -hmm. well right so mm -hmm. that's true they, yeah that, that's currently my life but uh, okay if i don't have 500 <laughs> gpus to train these models on exactly so, um but is it just me who, who is this poor guy with just 10 gpus <laughs> or um who, who still needs to use models but yeah i i, I like to give you on that I, I i do think it's it's gonna stay yeah, important and, think, and yeah. If we if we want to you know if we want to design robots that might be able to train in a in a in a kind of uh, flexible way right and maybe train quickly, um, I, I was I was chatting to someone the other day and saying you know if you think about you know what what other uh, think think about household uh, appliances that have kind of really changed our lives by by giving us lots of time back. Um, and I mean, I, I can think of the dishwasher and the washing machine, right? These two are, are really, and you know, is there anything else? Are there any other household um, appliances that, that really give us tons of time back? I, I yeah, don't yeah. think, you know, may, maybe vacuum, you know, vacuum cleaners uh, and auto, you know, robot vacuum cleaners, yes. Um, and I think that, you know, AI hasn't hasn't really made it into into these tasks, and the reason for that is that, yeah, we, we I mean, the, the 
the if a robot has to learn to fold clothes if a robot has to learn to deal with with very kind of intricate shapes and the mess in a house and you know the fact that it's ever changed an ever changing environment we we can't just you know give it all the images in the world <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, to train right we we need to do some 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 clever uh yeah in in my in my view you know you you really need 3d to 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 make uh learning more agile <laughs> awesome that, that's a nice perspective and uh, we could take one more question but i i would like to ask uh, you to set up because she's gonna give the sure, presentation yes. in, in five yes, minutes yes. so i'll so stop sharing this yes. exactly that would be nice and yeah hi see you <laughs> we have a european day today yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she's joining from Switzerland. Um, yeah, do we have any any other questions from the audience? Maybe even from the in-person room in Toronto. That would be nice. Yeah, I guess otherwise um, we we have a very short break. It's always good to have. So thanks a lot, thanks again, Doris. Again, thanks uh, for showing, thank sharing your insights and maybe also some of your secrets of how you look at these problems and how you <laughs> find new projects of. Uh, what to work on. Uh, very insightful. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Okay. Um, yeah, then we have a short break. I also want to grab a glass of water for myself. Um, is it working on your side, Sijo? I want to, I want, hi, I want to try. So let me. Yeah. Uh, can you see my slides? Yeah, we see. Um, yeah, now it's up. Yeah, we see the full screen now. Perfect. Okay. All right, good. Thanks. Do you want to try a video or it's uh, static slides? Um, I mean, can see yeah, it the... works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, works. all right, good. Good. Then... Okay, awesome. Yeah, great to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> so and we then... start in a few minutes. Yeah, in two minutes. Uh, uh, Oh, 9 30 my time 12 30 toronto time what time is it for you uh 6 30 in the <laughs> evening <laughs> yeah <It's lovely>. thank <laughs> thanks for coming at these weird times everybody and we have people mostly from canada some from the us some from europe some from all, all over the world so <laughs> um, i wonder what's the most weird time as people join in <laughs> but yeah let me quickly grab yes. grab a glass of water and then i'm back in a minute mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, so this morning is a little vision heavy, but as you've seen, there are lots of um, connections as well to robotics. So I, I hope everybody gets gets a share. And honestly, for me, um, coming more from vision and graphics, the robotics talks are even the more interesting, perhaps a bit, because I, I learn more. So I yeah, I hope we, we can have a, a, a nice conversation here. So um, after the lunch break, we, we're going to have a session on robotics in, uh, in case you're, you're tuned for that. And um, yeah, we hit 9.30, maybe let's give it 30 seconds till everybody is back back in time. Um, yeah, also let me know. So so all the sessions are gonna be in this Zoom room, um, except the post session, with it, which is on Gather Town. So um, please try it out before, um, whether you hit any issues there, because it's yeah, just a one hour session. And if you have issues in the beginning, then you will miss uh, most of it. Uh, so just reach out to me here on uh, Zoom if you have any issues joining that. Um, yeah, but otherwise, with, without further ado, let's go to our, our first oral session of the day. And um, yeah, Sue will uh, host the session. She will first give a talk about her own research and then uh, share the rest of the session with the um, paper presentations from this conference. 
So um, this talk is going to be 12 minutes plus three minutes uh, Q and A. And um, yeah, let, let me say a few words about Siu Tang. Um, she's uh, an amazing researcher. I know her from my time at API. We were both PhD students. She was on the top floor. Uh, I was in, in the fourth floor, different department. But um, yeah, she's still still working in the same building. So yeah, yeah, you get to meet each other. Amazing work. Um, you, you did, you get best paper awards at BMWC, 3DV. Um, you were best paper award candidate for CVPR. I mean, the fair thousands of submissions, that, that's all already a, a huge achievement. And you got the LS PhD award and uh, as, as well as a dissertation award from Tech M VM, MV Tech. Uh, yeah, so a lot, lot, lot of awards and um, that finally led you to the ETH Zurich, so an amazing um, location in Europe to be at, where she started in 2020, I believe. So relatively new, but still has done a lot of work already. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more of what you're doing currently and what you <laughs> are planning for the future. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, and I'm really glad to be here. Uh, so today I will talk about our recent work uh, on uh, uh, generating humans for virtual environment. Does it work? Okay. So uh, given a 3D scene, uh, our goal is to inhabit it with diverse virtual humans. So this can be useful for architecture design uh, or game development, development and uh, or like uh, synthetic data creation. So however, there is no existing solutions to generate uh, digital humans which have uh, diverse identities, uh, move perpetually and interact with the virtual world naturally. So, uh, so this task is close related to the uh, character animation. So existing solutions in character animation can produce controllable and high quality human motion. However, uh, they are often not well scalable to animate a large variety of human bodies. And the generated human uh, motion sequences are often close to the training data and often lack diversity. Uh, in addition, so using time series models for human motion generation can well generalize across different body shapes and action types, for example, this one. But the produced motions is often uh, not realistic enough. Uh, for example, uh, body floating, foot skating, and other uh, artifacts ex exist. So to, uh, to this end, uh, in our group, we create data-driven method for generating virtual humans in motion. So in an uh, automatic and efficient manner. So our virtual humans uh, have diverse identities uh, and various body shapes, move for uh, perpetually and interact with the virtual world naturally. So for example, these are the virtual humans generated by our generative human motion models uh, for a CAD like uh, architecture. And this is basically a scan of our uh, student room. And you can see this are the generated virtual humans like walking in this room. Okay, so uh, our model is called Gamma. It's, a, it's a, a generative motion primitives via body surface markers. And this work will be presented uh, this month at CVPR. And at the same time, this work is a part of an exhibition at the Guggenheim Museum Bilbao in Spain. So in the next, I will uh, talk about the key idea of this work. So there are three key ideas. The first one is a marker-based body representation. And the second one is a, a generative motion primitives. And the third one is motion, uh, how do we control the motion? So motion control. So let's start with the first one. So lots of previous work use skeleton to represent uh, human bodies. For example, this one. However, as the time progresses, the skeleton can become less and less human in proportion. And at the end of the sequence, the skeleton sometimes rarely corresponds to a valid human body. 
And so people also use surface-based uh, human body models uh, to represent human emotion by predicting the joint location, joint rotations of the body model. But they often don't include global trajectory, for example, this, uh, this work. Uh, because of combining the global trajectory and local articulation is hard. And the question we have is, how do we combine the advantage of both? So meaning effectively combine the global motion and the local articulation at the same time produce valid and realistic 3D human bodies instead of skeleton. So actually the idea of macro-based uh, body representation was proposed the last year in our SVPR work called Mojo. So uh, basically we represent 3D human body in motion with a sparse set of surface markers corresponding to those used in the motion capture system. So predicting markers has uh, 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 several advantages. First, these markers capture the full degree freedom of body poses. So not like the uh, skeleton based approach, which you, for example, you lose uh, this kind of rotation degree of freedom. So surface marker basically can capture the full degree of freedom of uh, body poses. And second, uh, with this surface marker, we can leverage powerful statistical body shape models during the inference to directly get the valid body, human body back. So what is the key idea of this uh, using marker in, in, in body uh, uh, generation or your in body synthesis? So in the nutshell, it is a conditional variational autoencoder with recurrent projections. So given the past motion of a person presented by 3D marker locations, as shown here, right? So the encoder is a GRU uh, and it encodes the input marker sequence into a latent code. And a very standard way to predict future motions is that the decoder, for example, can take the uh, latest representations from the encoder uh, and a random sample from some prior and predict uh, uh, and the prediction from the previous time step, right? To generate 3D marker locations uh, for the current time step as shown on the right. The problem of such standard way of doing that is the GRU tend to accumulate errors over time, right? So the predicted markers can gradually deviate from a valid 3D human body result uh, in twisted torsos or foot skating or other artifacts. So to eliminate these accumulated errors, so in our work at each, so basically this is uh, previous work in CBPR, right? So in this work, at each prediction steps, we project, we have a projection uh, module. So we project the predicted marker uh, back to a valid body surface. So to achieve this, we fit a simple X body mesh into the predicted markers. And by optimizing this objective functions uh, shown in the bottom, we can basically uh, fit a simple body mesh into the predict markers. So since the marker provide rich body constraints like, uh, uh, like uh, controlling the full degree of freedom of limb rotations, and we also start close to the solution. So this fitting process is not uh, super slow. <laughs> so basically from our, this uh, recurrent projection scheme, we not only obtain the regularized markers, but we also uh, obtain the realistic 3D bodies as shown on the, on the right. So these are the uh, results you can see. So basically this uh, green, green color is a, a input motion and we can predict two, three seconds in the future. And you can see the motion is diverse, right? Okay, so, but if you remember, our goal is to generate perpetual motion, right? The motion moves very, very long. And you can see this is what happens when we generate a six second motion. You already, even with this projection scheme, you already observe the foot skating, right? So you can see like this uh, GRU has a hard time to really generate long-term old motions without uh, like uh, uh, artifacts. So what do we do? Uh, in the latest work, Gamma, what we did is we, we basically propose this motion primitive. So we propose like with GRU, we only predict very short term motions, right? And we call this motion primitive. And then that comes to the second key idea of this whole, uh, whole motion generative framework is a generative motion primitives. 
Okay, so our idea is to model a long-term motion or perpetual motion, we decompose it into motion primitives and model each individual primitives and then concatenate them together to generate perpetual motion. And our insight comes actually from the psychological studies. So humans reaction time to visual st stimuli is about 0 0.25 uh, seconds. That means human cannot control their body motion immediately after they see after seeing a signal, but have to wait for 0 0.25 seconds to give a response due to the body uh, inertia. So basically, then our idea is to let a motion primitive span 0 0.25 seconds, and in this case, it mainly constrained by the unconscious body dynamics, which are shorter. Uh, uh, like an easy to model. So that's a key idea. So basically, I'm going to show you the, the uh, uh, like architecture, not the detailed architecture, but the overall framework. So given a motion seat, it could be one static frame or two, for example, static frames, right? Uh, uh, continue frames. So the model first predicts marker location uh, in the very near future with uncertainty right so this is very similar to the to the model i showed you before this uh, this marker uh, predictor it has it's a conditional variational autoencoder it has an encoder giu to encode the input motion seat and it has a conditional branch and it's also have a decoder to basically pre predict the marker locations in 20 uh, 0 0.25 seconds right so this y are the marker locations and we have a, a prior right Okay, and you can see this is the predicted uh, uh, marker locations, uh, and we the next step is a body regressor. So instead of using the optimization process I, I showed uh, in in the model previously, we use the body regressor. So this becomes faster, right? So basically, body body regressor is just a stack a stack of residual and uh, MLPs. And with this body markers and the initial body parameters, uh, so uh, the regressor can recover the 3D body efficiently. So this is, you can see. And this is uh, very similar to the, uh, to the model architecture. Okay, and now you can see these are all the motion primitives, like 0 0.5 seconds. And if you look at the last one, you can see like even give the same motion seat. Uh, this motion primitives can generate different motion, uh, uh, short-term motion, right? So it has, has an uncertainty uh, here. Okay, so given the motion primitives, this is what you see before, right? And what we did is basically with this extra very simple modular, one is blending and one is a, a canonicalization. So we can, uh, this generative motion primitives can run recursively. And then the body can move perpetually without sacrificing the motion realism. So I will quickly go through this because I see the time is running out. <laughs> Sorry about, sorry about that. So you can see this is a humor, so our baseline, and uh, this is also a general human motion model. And you can see, uh, so they also have a very good result for long-term motion generation. But I think there are some like foot skating, you can see, and also unrealistic motions. And in our experiment, our model performs more stable when we generate really long-term motions. So the last key idea is motion control. So for this motion control, we basically use a Markov decision process. So we model this uh, as a Markov decision process. So our goal is to let the virtual humans reach the goal, right? And this MP formulation, we have state, action, model, and policy. And in the next, I will just briefly tell you what, what is that. So this is our like perpetual motion generation model, right? We have a marker predictor, we have a body regressor, we get our 0 0.25 second motion and we do this recursively and then we generate perpetual motion. And in when we have a motion control, when we want the uh, virtual humans to reach certain point in the 3D environment, what we did is basically we add a policy network. So you can see now this state is basically the, the goal in the, like the, the target goal in the 3D space, the body markers like a status. And then we have this new network to give us a policy. And basically the action is regarded as a latent variable Z. 
uh, as an action uh, to uh, as an action to generate the current motion primitives. So now this Z is not from the uh, the Gaussian uh, the, the the prior. It basically comes from this uh, policy network. Okay, so how this policy graduated learn, and you can see in the epoch zero, it does basically ignore the target, right? And then you can see in the ep epoch 25, it start to reach, trying to reach the target, but re really we are uh, with weird poses, right? And struggling. And with epoch, epoch 50, it's getting better, but still quite uh, struggling. <laughs> and it's, I mean, getting better, but yeah. A better, I think this is much better. And then as epoch uh, 50, 500, so basically uh, this virtual humans try to reach the, the goal, <laughs> right? Because, but because there is a, like a general part, so they all move like differently. And this is how do we, how we inhabited the virtual city, right? So we decide the uh, goal for this virtual humans, and you can see our generative human mo uh, uh, motion models can basically generate realistic motions for different uh, body shapes. So they are really tall person and uh, big person or small person, right? And each one moves differently. So, but they all try to reach the goal. Okay. Uh, so the last thing I want to show is basically what we, we do with this motion model is basically we have an exhibition at, at the Guggenheim Museum Bibao. And uh, so basically just some background about it. So Graham Matthew and the Color Research as the architect department of ETH Truig are invited to participate in this exhibition. And they decided to revisit, it's a called a flight, flight uh, and, and uh, ensembled architecture project. Right. So just as some background. So basically, this project is uh, so it's a 600 uh, meter high pedestrian city for 30,000 inhabitants, so peoples. And this has been conceived by Grammatical Color Research with, uh, with uh, robotics group at ETH3 in 2012. And this meta structure will be built and continuously re reconfigured by autonomous drones. So this is the idea, right? And in uh, in ten years later, <laughs> so they want to revisit this project. So basically, the idea is in this exhibition. The idea is to repopulate this six hundred meter high city with many autonomous virtual humans who possess diverse body shapes and move perpetually in an automatic and a scalable and controlled manner. And in this exhibition, the visitors can see these virtual humans walking through the buildings, and they are able also they can also take from the first person perspective to see how virtual humans perceive these spaces. And based on the feedback from the architects, this is very interesting because it points towards a future research where architectures, architectures can be first tested by being virtually inhabited before it's actually built. And it's, this is kind of a new reality for the design of architecture. So what I have talked about is basically this work. We are going to present a CVPR. And if you're interested in exhibition, it's in Spain. And it will last until September. And thank you very much. And sorry for running over time. <laughs> no worries. It was super interesting. Thanks so much. Thank you. And we started slightly late. So no worries. Um, we have a bit of a buffer too. Um, yeah, amazing work. And those of you who have seen the sponsor talk at the beginning of the conference, they had this virtual world for autonomous driving. Mm -hmm. They had some uh, some virtual characters in there, but they looked very robotic. And um, yeah, but they need something like the, the things you were working on. Maybe so we could that, talk. <laughs> yeah, uh, Oxbotica, you, you should talk to them. Maybe somebody <laughs> of them is there or, or during the poster session. Yeah. Um, awesome. Do we have a quick question from the audience? For uh, Tang, anyone in chat in the room in Toronto? Here. But maybe I can have a quick one. So, so what is your perspective on, on the future? It looks like you've solved all these problems already, or what is left <laughs> to do? So, there are plenty to do. So uh, we so basically so we paper what we learn is paper actually is a paper and what we have to do for the exhibition is a deliverable stuff so it has to run in real time in uh in omniverse 
so everything. And in order to make it stable, for example, we have to, we can't really generate human behaviors like sitting or lying or like more diverse behaviors because then it will, the genetic motion model sometimes will break, right? So I think like how to really have more type of interactions in this virtual environment is a very challenging, but very interesting uh, future work. Awesome, yeah, yeah, thanks again for the talk. And um, I don't know, are you prepared to introduce the, the, the next speakers from the session? Uh, I yeah, have please. the, <laughs> I can't, I mean, I have the uh, uh, project, I have the program. So if you like, you can introduce if I, if you, you want me to introduce, I can also introduce. Yeah, it would be nice if you do that. Um, okay, okay, yes. And yeah, um, and also for the speakers, um, uh, do we have them all there? So let's quickly check, so that should be, um Eric? simple method to boost human post estimation i see eric there instant segmentation of fairing and salmon and supervised contrastive learning do we have everybody there okay, okay. alex is there and the last one um supervised contrastive learning yeah. ali as well yeah. awesome okay just to check that everybody's there yeah then uh, see you. you you can continue and deduce the speakers okay and everyone to take uh seven minutes maybe eight but not more <laughs> Otherwise, we run over. <laughs> okay, so uh, I mean, maybe we just get started because we're running uh, out of time. So the first speaker will be uh, from Eric from uh, UBC, right? And I look forward to your talk. Thank you. Uh, I apologize. They decided to do construction today. So if you hear that, uh, I apologize. So uh, the paper is uh, my, first of all, my name is Eric Hedlin, and uh, the paper is A Simple Method to Boost Human Pose Estimation Accuracy by Correcting the Joint Regressor for the Human 3.6M Data Set. This is with uh, me, uh, Helge Roden, and then Kwon Buyi from the University of British Columbia. The performance of many of the top human pose estimation methods are being underreported. These methods estimate the parameters for a human body model uh, given an input image. An example for a visualized pose from this method can be seen on the right in gray. And from this, you can regress uh, individual joint locations as, can, as you can see in the blue and green points. So as can be seen on the right, the projected locations of the regressed joints for the currently accepted joint regressor in green don't seem to correspond to the exact same location on the body in the input image. The error is easiest to see on the ankles as outlined in red. And the important thing here is that the currently accepted joint regressor seems to um, have its location much closer to the Achilles tendon, where the ground truth joints seem to be uh, just behind the ankle. And we improve on this. The projected locations for the joints output by our joint regressor, as shown in blue, seem to match the locations of the ground truth joints on the human much better. So the body model these methods use is called SMPL. We got a quick introduction on this earlier, but basically it represents the minimally closed surface of the human body. What this does is this takes this template mesh with around 7,000 vertices and deforms it to match any pose that a person can be in. And the important thing here is that any individual vertex corresponds to a semantically consistent location across the body. So say the vertex that corresponds to the tip of the finger will always uh, be at the tip of the finger. And because of this, you can apply a single linear layer on the output for the final posed vertices and um, get any location that corresponds to any point on the body. And again, as we've already seen, many human body pose data sets provide ground truth 3D joint locations, like, for example, the popular human 3.6M data set. In this data set in particular, the participants are fitted with uh, markers, as you could see on the white points on the person on the right. And these are tracked in 3D to lead to very accurate ground truth joint locations. But it does mean that for these methods that train and evaluate uh, SMPL-based pose estimation methods, you need to use a joint regressor. So these models have settled on using the same joint regressor for this data set, which was estimated using MOSH. 
Mosh takes a series of ground truth joint locations and estimates a set of plausible poses corresponding to those human body poses. These, uh, so the output of this method is a series of ground truth, uh, pseudo ground truth body surfaces. And you can take this and the corresponding ground truth joint locations and train a regressor. So importantly here, Mosh does not use the input images. Uh, meaning that there's nothing directly ensuring that the estimated poses align with the person in the image. And to solve this, we train our joint regressor in a way that includes the input image. So first we take a human body pose estimator from an um, run on this input image to get an initial estimated pose. And then we optimize the pose in a way that includes the input image as well. And these final poses are used to train the joint regressor. And here are some of the details of the inner optimization loop. First, we differentially render the poses to give an estimated per pixel occupancy. And we apply a loss between this and an estimated per pixel occupancy from MaskR CNN. These MaskR CNN estimates, as you can see, aren't perfect. But what's more important here is that this loss leads to useful gradients. And uh, we also supervise these poses to align with the ground truth 3D joints. For this, we actually initialize a new joint regressor using poses directly from the human uh, pose estimator uh, using that as pseudo ground truth. And we do this as opposed to using the currently accepted joint regressor because we have seen that it has flaws. And also importantly is that the weights of this joint regressor are frozen uh, during optimization to avoid any joint drift. And we also include a post discriminator to avoid the poses getting warped in ways that aren't uh, physically plausible. And this is low dimensional here, so it's not uh, difficult to converge. And Using our joint regressor, simply swapping out the joint regressor improves the results of many of these top performing human uh, methods on hu the human 3.6M data set. In this evaluation, we don't retrain any of these methods, just reevaluate them with our new joint regressor. And I think it's important to say here that we follow the classic training and testing split on these data sets. So we use no more information than these methods had themselves. And here we show the uh, mean per joint position error, as well as the aligned mean per joint position error. And one thing you might notice is that the retrained joint regressor without the inner optimization loop already improves results, suggesting that these methods were trained on mismatched joint regressors across the data sets. And this, uh, including the optimized uh, optimization step in the middle, this doesn't actually add that much improvement. But this evaluation doesn't really show the entire picture. Here we are evaluating methods that were trained with an incorrect joint regressor with one that is semantically accurate. And once again, looking at the visualized results, it's apparent that the regress joint locations on the SMPL poses seem to correspond to the same points on the ground truth poses uh, with the natural images. And these are just a few examples, but this can be seen from any angle. And thank you very much. Our uh, code and joint regressor are available. The, uh, the link is here, but it's also in our paper. Thank you very much for the uh, very nice talk. So are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, let's uh, save the questions for the end. Uh, that worked okay. really well last year that we have three presentations and then all the questions at the end. But if, oh. if you have one, it, it might be good to already type it in the chat. Otherwise okay. you lose kind of track of it. So yeah. whoever has a question, maybe make a note in the chat. And then we, we can take it all at the end. Yes, then let's uh, continue with the second talk uh, from Alex, right? Hello. You can, you can start, yeah. Okay, yeah, hi. Uh, okay, let's see, share screen. Uh, Sorry, just a second here. Uh, okay, hi everyone. Uh, can you see my slides okay? Yes. Okay, 
Perfect. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending. My name is Alex Slonimer, uh, and today I am discussing um, uh, the instant segmentation of fish schools in multi-frequency echograms using a novel approach with a hybrid UNAT. So echo sounders are instruments that use sonar to profile the ocean, uh, and these profiles are combined to create images known as echograms. Uh, and echograms can be used to study both biological and physical phenomena in the oceans. Uh, but unfortunately, the manual classification of this data is very challenging, and it's prone to analyst error. So we need a method that can automate the classification to enable fast and accurate ocean studies. Um, and so the main focus of this paper was taking raw echograms shown to the right uh, and training a neural network to apply instant segmentation of herring and salmon schools. Uh, and so the data used in this study was collected on the coast of British Columbia uh, in an area with a water depth of approximately 60 meters. And the focus was on juvenile salmon in the area, but the echograms also picked up on herring schools, which scatter acoustic frequencies much the same way as salmon. Um, and so the instrument used to collect this data uh, rather than the camera, which uh, sort of faces forward uh, is something called a bottom mounted echo sounder uh, and it's equipped with four frequencies uh, and this one specifically is an acoustic zooplankton and fish profile or, or AZFP and it emits an acoustic beam every three seconds and it ensonifies a conic like region above the instrument uh, and then it measures the intensity of acoustic energy scattered from targets in the water such as fish plankton and air bubbles um, and so this study focused on one hour echograms uh, depth is on the y-axis, uh, time is on the x-axis, and uh, the backscatter intensity is indicated by color. Um, and so multiple sonar frequencies allow us to uh, detect different properties of targets in the ocean. Uh, and these are properties such as size, shape, material composition, and the number of targets per volume. And this is what makes it possible to identify different fish species. Um, so visually, we can interpret uh, the content of these echograms, uh, where the sea surface is this bright yellow band near the top of the images. Uh, herring are identified because they are a densely packed schooling species, um, and so they tend they're bright and intense, uh, and they tend to be below about 10 meters water depth, uh, whereas juvenile salmon, uh, they gather in sparse aggregations and they tend to stay close to the surface. So, and then another important type of information is the environment in which this data is collected. And this is because environment has a direct impact on the biological behavior of these species. So in addition to the four channels of echogram data, uh, two context channels were generated to serve as proxies for the environmental conditions. And so these plots on the right uh, indicate this data showing one hour corresponding to the one hour echograms. Uh, so the top is the top is depth, uh, and it's calculated relative to the sea surface. Um, and then the bottom is a uh, solar elevation angle. And this is an indicator of daylight or more generally a proxy for time. Uh, and so in previous studies, uh, bounding polygons have been used for classifying fish schools. And while this works well for densely schooling species such as herring, uh, it's less suited for sparsely schooling the species such as salmon, where schools are irregularly shaped. Um, there's no well-defined edge necessarily, uh, and there may also be gaps or holes present. Uh, and this can be problematic for quantifying the area of a fish school, and then can require post-processing work prior to making biomass estimates, which is kind of the eventual goal of this, of this study, or of these studies. And so to properly label uh, sparsely distributed salmon schools with instant segmentation, it makes sense to use a pixel level classifier followed by some technique to merge the pixels into distinct schools. And UNETs are a great choice for this because they don't require pre-training and they can be successful with relatively small sets of training examples. And thus they can also be easily trained for arbitrary numbers of input channels. And so following the semantic segmentation, Following the semantic segmentation, a heuristic module is run uh, that is inspired by traditional methods for defining schools and echograms. And so as noted so far, there were a total of six input channels, 
But I also experimented with training a network using just the four echogram channels without the context of depth or time. And so there was a total of 102 annotated echograms and the network was trained with just 71 of these. And so the echograms were 1200 by 570 pixels. Uh, and these were split up into square tiles for input to the network. Um, and for training the models, uh, the, there was random positioning used between the tiles uh, to increase the number of training examples. And because these context channels have been introduced, uh, the positional information is retained even when the echograms are divided into these tiles. And so the next step is to pass the new net results through the heuristic module for combining the pixel level labels uh, into instances. And this approach is based on traditional school classification methods. Uh, so the first step is to uh, identify uh, school candidates, which, which is done with a connected component analysis on the pixels identified by the unit. Uh, and the next step is to link school candidates uh, within some maximum linking distance. Uh, and the final step is to output distinct schools or instances. And these results are quantified in terms of intersection over union or IOU. And from this SIT figure, we see that the results are very good and all the positive detections uh, exceed 70%, even for aggregations that are quite sparse. Um, and a previous study was done that looked at the same echograms, but created polygons for labeling the schools. Uh, and mask RCNN was used for instant segmentation. And that model was applied to the same test set, and the results were compared to these new high granularity annotations. And both of these approaches had no issues classifying herring, uh, but the mask RCNN approach performed very poorly for salmon. And we can see this represented in the metrics where the hybrid unit uh, is nearly twice as effective uh, relative to mask or CNN for classifying instances of SAM schools. Uh, and these results are possible because the hybrid unit method uses a fundamentally different approach for understanding instances where a certain degree of disconnectedness is actually allowed. Um, and it's also important to see that uh, the implementation of the context channels uh, led to uh, improvements for classifying both herring and salmon schools. So uh, this hybrid unit model uh, has demonstrated as being capable of highly granular uh, classification uh, and able to identify sparsely distributed instances and outperform state-of-the-art mask RCNN. And um, new applications uh, may arise from this work, including a method for classifying uh, all sorts of sparsely aggregating fish and it may also be useful for classifying sparsely distributed objects and other types of data as well. And then just some acknowledgments for everybody that's contributed to this work. Thank you very much. It was a very nice talk. Yeah. So uh, as, as suggested, we will leave the question in the end and we move to the next talk. Yes, so while the speaker set up, maybe I can introduce. So uh, it will be presented by uh, Ali, right? <laughs> and as supervised contrastive learning of detecting uh, anomalous, anomalous driving behaviors from multimodal uh, videos, multimodal videos. Please. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Ali Abedi. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Kite uh, Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, which University Health Network also. Uh, other authors are affiliated with Kite and uh, the University of Toronto. Uh, I will present uh, uh, this paper uh, titled Supervised Contrastive Learning for Detecting Anomalous Driving Behaviors from Multimodal Videos. Uh, but what is uh, anomalous driving? Uh, any deviations from uh, normal driving that need to be uh, detected to alert the driver to reduce the risk of accident. Uh, we call it uh, anomalous driving. For example, here in the first row, uh, we can see uh, some frames of some uh, videos containing uh, normal driving behavior. And uh, we can see that the uh, driver has a, a normal uh, head pose and uh, uh, hand pose. Any deviations from uh, this normal driving behavior uh, in the, for example, in the second row or third row uh, can be considered as uh, anomalous driving behavior. And our task is to uh, detect these anomalous driving behaviors. 
Uh, we use supervised contrastive learning for uh, this task of anomaly detection. Uh, in the training phase, uh, we learn uh, some, uh, uh, we learn one normal driving template vector or VN. And then in test phase, uh, we consider clips with feature vectors uh, deviant from VN as uh, anomalous uh, uh, clips. Uh, it's our uh, neural network architecture. Uh, we have a 3D CNN. Uh, we call it uh, a base encoder, uh, which is a 3D ResNet. Uh, and then we have a fully connected neural network uh, containing two fully connected layers and uh, an L2 node. Uh, we call it a projection head. Uh, also, we call them F theta and uh, G theta. Uh, 3D CNN and uh, this uh, fully connected neural network extract 512 dimensional and 128 dimensional uh, feature vectors from uh, normal and anomalous uh, training samples. And then this 112 dimensional feature vectors will be considered as the input to uh, this contrastive last function. Uh, in this contrastive last function, VNs are uh, features extracted from uh, normal samples and uh, VAs are features extracted from anomalous samples. Uh, by uh, minimizing this last function, uh, we have a trained network. We have a trained uh, 3D CNN and uh, uh, a trained uh, fully connected neural network. And uh, the training of these two modules uh, is in a, a joint learning setting. Uh, we suggested to modify this last function by adding this term to the denominator. And uh, we call it uh, modified uh, contrastive last function. And here M is the number of uh, anomalous, uh, the total number of anomalous uh, training uh, uh, samples. Then uh, in the test phase, in the original contrastive learning setting, uh, we remove the uh, projection head from our network and uh, we just use base encoder, which is a 3D CNN. Uh, using this base encoder, we extract uh, feature vectors F theta from all the uh, normal training samples. Here, XIs are uh, normal training samples. Uh, after extracting these feature vectors from all the normal training samples, we uh, construct this uh, normal dri driving template vector using this. Uh, equation of uh, averaging. Uh, then uh, during testing, we calculate the cosine similarity between uh, this normal driving template vector and a normalized feature vector extracted from test samples. Uh, based on this similarity, we uh, classify an input video uh, as a normal or anomalous. High similarity samples will be considered as a normal driving and low similarity samples will be considered as anomalous driving. Uh, here we suggest to uh, maintain this uh, projection head in addition to base encoder to construct this normal driving template vector. Uh, and also for calculating similarity between uh, feature vectors of test samples and this template vector, again, we uh, maintain both base encoder and projection head. Uh, we use the data set uh, in this paper uh, uh, to uh, evaluate the proposed method. Uh, this data set is a, a multi-view data set having uh, top view and front view. Also, it's a multimodal data set having uh, depth camera modality and uh, infrared camera modality. Here also we can see the uh, statistics of uh, normal and uh, anomalous samples in this data set, as we can see that uh, this data set is uh, somehow imbalanced. Uh, so we have these uh, modifications to the original uh, contrastive learning setting. We uh, modified the contrastive loss. We suggested to maintain projection. Uh, also, uh, we performed a manual labeling process. Uh, we manually removed uh, some normal frames from anomalous clips in the training set. Uh, we wanted to make uh, anomalous samples in the training set uh, more pure. We, want, we wanted to make them more anomalous. After these three uh, major modifications, uh, here we can see the results of uh, uh, different methods uh, on, the, on the, the data set. Uh, for example, here we can see the results of original loss and uh, the modified loss or, or proposed loss. Here we can see the results of uh, removing projection head or uh, maintaining projection head. 
original labeling or manual labeling. Uh, also, we can see the results of uh, different modalities and also the late fusion of different modalities. Uh, for example, here we can see that the late fusion of uh, all four modalities, uh, depth, infrared, uh, front, and top, uh, the result will result in the highest uh, AUC ROC. Also, here we can see area under the curve of the precision recall curve. Uh, using this evaluation metric, we can see that uh, this time again, uh, or uh, a modified contrastive loss works better than original loss. But uh, uh, considering this uh, evaluation metric, removing uh, projection head is better than uh, maintaining the projection head. Uh, we can see a video of uh, the proposed method in uh, detecting anomalous driving behavior. Here, low scores or low, similar low similarities uh, with the normal template vectors uh, uh, shows uh, uh, anomalous driving behavior. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, so are there any questions for these three talks from the audience? A very shy audience this time. <laughs> <coughs> so I can yeah. start with one question. Yeah, yeah. for the, yeah. Uh, maybe for the first talk. So uh, yeah. I think there was a question by Mohamad. Yeah, exactly. Can I? So um, for everyone having yes, questions, so on the bottom, you see these reactions, and there's also a raise hand. That's uh -huh. the best way of indicating whether uh, if you want to um, have a question. Oh, you, you had your hand up. Sorry, I didn't see it. Um, yeah, so sorry for the interruption. Go ahead. Yeah, please. sure. Thank you so much. I have a question from Ali for the uh, anomalous behavior de uh, detection. Is the model that you have trained, uh, I mean, the template, the normal template, is it conditioned to uh, different driving scenes? I mean, maybe the normal template for driving in the highway shouldn't be similar for a driving template when you are driving in the neighborhood or some crowd areas. So the template that you are learning from uh, in your data sets, is it just one sole driving template or is it conditioned to drive uh, to different conditions? Uh, yeah, this uh, normal template is actually average. It's average of all the normal samples in the data set. We extract feature vectors from all the normal samples in the data set and then we average them to uh, create a normal template for a uh, normal template vector for normal driving behavior. And in this data set, in this data set, BAD data set, uh, we have uh, videos of drivers uh, in a, a simulated car. You know, they have a simulated car. The car uh, is not uh, moving, uh, uh, but they have some participants to collect this data in a simulated setting. But the normal vector is the average of all the feature vectors of normal samples in the data set. Okay, thank you. So do you think that it is generalizable to different conditions, averaging? Uh, you know, it's an anomaly detection problem. And uh, uh, I think it can work because uh, we are calculating similarities. It depends on uh, how much these two classes are differentiable. You know, uh, it, yeah, you're right. It depends on the data set, maybe in different, uh, maybe in different also lighting condition, the situation may be different. But here we are doing an averaging and also uh, we are working in an anomaly detection environment. So uh, it should be somehow generalizable. Paco, I think your hand is up, so you can ask the next question. If you have one, you can also take yours first. I, okay, I can ask. For, so for the first uh, uh, talk, uh, so uh, yeah, it's very interesting work. So if I understand correctly, you train, you, you test, train, test, uh, no, you tested on uh, human uh, 3.6M, right? So have you tried other data sets to like with your 
You no, we only to... we only uh, applied this to the human three point six on the data set. But do you plan to try? Are, are there any difficulties you couldn't try? Um, yeah, it could it could be applied to any data set um, okay. that yeah that uh, just has ground truth three uh, D joints. Okay, I see. Cool. Thanks. I think that since the uh, if I had to guess, since the uh, simply retraining the joint regressor without any optimization improved results, those data sets are uh, quite aligned, but, um, or maybe they're just uh, all incorrect in ways that get averaged out to, um, you know, well imposed. But um, yeah, it, it's definitely something that could be looked into. Okay, good. Thanks. Uh, my question was actually on the second paper uh, for the fish school. Um, first of all, uh, a great Canadian project <laughs> to have salmons. And uh, second, I wondered, do you get, uh, maybe I missed it, but it, is it a 2D representation you have or do you actually get 3D as well from this, this sensor? Like, is it just a plane going up it's, or is it a volume? It's, um, it, it is volume, but it's converted into a um, into it, it's it's it, in a sense it's two D, but it's also it does have those additional that information for 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 depth and time. Uh, and what it actually is is that it's a profile, uh, mm -hmm. so it's sort of just measuring everything in the water column above it, and then each successive. Mm -hmm. Uh, profile in every, every seconds are all stacked together to create that sort of image that's that's seen. And have you considered using that somehow in your algorithm? Does it give you more information to look over time or yeah, in, in different directions? Um, I mean, in a sense, it kind of is. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm I, yeah, it might be tricky to, I, I, maybe I'm misunderstanding your question, but I, I think maybe it, in a sense, might already be kind of incorporated. Mm -hmm, because it's looking at this other dimension as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah I missed it then. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, yeah. Great work. And I like to see not just, I don't know, humans are very common. Sorry, Eric. <laughs> but I'm always working on humans. I, I, I'm, uh, I really like that we see a bit of more diverse applications here. So thanks yeah, a lot in, for your presentation. In Switzerland, we work on calls. <laughs> yeah, good. So that's the end of this session, right? And there, there will be a break. Yeah, I, I can say a few more words. So okay. first of all, there's also Ziu Chen, my co-program chair. Uh, she will be more active in the, in the second half of this, the, this day. But um, big thanks for her also to managing a lot of the work. Uh, work. Uh, since I was busy changing diapers, we just got a little sun two weeks ago. And um, yeah, so that took lots, lots of my time. So thanks to her. And she will run um, the social student event. It's at 16.45. Um, yeah, first of all, we should applaud to all the speakers again. Sorry for interrupting that. Um, but yeah, we, we, we do have the um, uh, Kippers annual general meeting coming up. So um, I believe everybody who registered for CRV is also a member of Kippers. So you're all welcome to, to stay. But um, I would also like to invite you to join for the student event and not just the students because students always tell me they would like to inter interact with more seniors, uh, uh, more senior people. So um, the symposium speakers, everybody else who, who's not a student, you're also invited to come and uh, chat with the students. So it's meant as a social e event. And yeah, that, that's at um, 4.45 uh, Toronto time. So right after the poster session. Thanks. And I'll just jump here, just a quick word on Kippers. Can you hear us all right? All good? Yeah, yeah. Okay, oh, you guys can hear us. Okay, great. We haven't tried from this room yet, so I just wanted to make sure. But just for the uh, Kippers AGM, we'll start 15 minutes after the start of lunch. So we'll just take a short break so everybody can run out and grab lunch. And then we'll be right back in this breakout room for the Kip Kippers AGM, if you wanna come. All right, thanks. Thanks, Steve. Oh. Okay, and yeah, here, here just um, this one document where I put all the relevant links. Um, 
you, you can use it, can bookmark it. And there's a link to the gather town. There's a link to the Zoom room. There's a link to the um, calendar we created to, so you can keep track of your sessions in, in the right time zone. I should have used it earlier to not mix up the time for Lourdes this morning. <laughs> um, yeah, th that could be helpful. And we note that we corrected the start time. We were missing the sponsors talk in the in the mornings. So these are now corrected that um, we start at 10.30, no, at, at 10.45 Toronto time. Steve, do you want to say a bit what's, what's Kippers AGM is? Yes, You're that's muted. a good idea, yeah. So, so Kippers is the society that runs the CRV conference. Um, and the AGM is just literally going over what happened last year at the conference in terms of uh, the finances and how this year is looking, and then also making decisions in terms of the leadership. So if you like this community and you want to become a part of it or more uh, in, involved, then, then the AGM is a, is a nice place to, to get to know us. We're looking for new board members. So if anyone wants to join the uh, AGM board, you can uh, come and uh, uh, volunteer your services. And similarly, we're looking for a new general chair for next year for this conference um, for AI and CRV. So if you have any uh, inclination to start that kind of efforts, uh, please join us. Awesome. We'll see you at the meeting. Yeah, you could self-nominate yourself, but also if you know somebody, if also, you yeah. know somebody whom we should invite as a an, um, symposium speaker next year or as a program chair or in, in any, any, maybe a keynote speaker you, you would like to see, let us know. Uh, we really um, like, like to get this input because um, our views might be biased. We were trying our best, but we, we might miss very important people uh, in Canada and beyond. So let us know if there's somebody you would like to see in, in any of these roles. Perfect. Okay, I think it's time for lunch. Thanks for your question, for the question, Root Rush. Yeah, see you, see you in 15 minutes. Awesome. All right, take care, everyone. Yeah.